That's, that's the gavel. Um, tonight we will continue with the series of uh, budget presentations and discussions on the town budget. And uh, this evening we'll hear from the directors of the public library, the, the fire and EMS, police, dispatch, and our CASA, and facilities. Just to repeat what I said last night for those of you who didn't tune, tune in, um, these presentations and discussions are part of a multi-step process. Uh, after these meetings, Bob will prepare a town manager budget. Uh, then the town badger manager's budget will go to FinCom. We have a couple of FinCom members with us here tonight. Uh, and then FinCom will deliberate, discuss the budget, and then present their recommendations to town meeting in April. And then the, the final version would be voted on by, by town meeting in April. Um, we're going to skip liaison reports this evening because we just uh, we had it last night. So we're going to go right to public. Anyone, would anyone like to make a public comment? Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to go right to see if Bob has any town manager report. Uh, Jane will give, give us the town manager report. <laughs> All right. Great, great report. Uh, the compost center will be open this Saturday and Sunday, Saturday, December 8th from 8 to 4 and Sunday the 9th from 12 to 4. So, okay. The last Great. weekend. Text mark. Excellent. <laughs> so 8 to 4 on Saturday. 8 to 4 on Saturday and Sunday 12 to 4. 12 to 4 on Sunday. Everybody Excellent. Get out your ladies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, get out your race. So if that is all, we'll jump right into the uh, continued budget presentation starting with the library. Okay. Well, um, my name is Amy Land and I'm the director of the Reading Public Library. Um, thank you for, as usual, every year we get the opportunity to present to the select board and more than once to people from the uh, finance committee. So on behalf of myself, the staff, and the board of trustees, um, I'll try and make this as painless as possible. Um, so each year we develop our annual municipal budget uh, recommendations based um, primarily on you know what we are going to need in order to fill our mission, our vision, our core values, as well as our strategic plan. Um, I included the library mission here, but you can always visit our website. It does include all of those guiding documents as well as the, strate the strategic plan which is running through fiscal year 21. We're required to file that every five years with Mass Board of Library Commissioners. So when I say MBLC, that's referring. Um, of course, we also have to maintain our minimum standards by law for a free public library service. Just to remind you of those, I list them there. They don't change from year to year. Uh, when we went over 25,000 uh, in our population and ready, we were permitted to drop down to a 13% uh, allocation of materials budget. However, the trustees have continued to recommend that we maintain that at 14%. And I'll actually revisit that in a, in a few minutes. Um, but these are mandates that we have to have, and I have to remind um, the viewing audience that it is imperative that we stay certified. Uh, it is not only make it not only uh, allows us to remain eligible for direct state aid. Um, and it also allows us to apply for state and federal grants if we're not, so we can't get those grants. And um, having being being certified allows our residents to use other libraries within the community, uh, within the Commonwealth, and those are reciprocal borrowing uh, privileges. What that means is if a community doesn't certify, uh, provide enough to certify their library, other libraries turn their back and say, I'm sorry, if you're not paying your taxes to support your library, then you can't use ours. So it, it's, it's part of a team player. So it is important that we remain cert certified. And um, the good news is, is we're nowhere close to not being certified. We are well within the, um, the mandates. Um, the other part that drives the planning process for us is to look, obviously, at the previous year, the fiscal year, we look at the data and impact. Um, I have this slide up first um, because it's the most, um, probably has, has had the bi biggest impact on us. Um, in fiscal year 18, we offered, or we had, 843 programs, which is a 42% increase over the previous year. We also had 25% higher attendance at these same programs. 22,000, almost 22,000 people <laughs> came to our library to attend programs. That is a huge amount of growth. 
um, it's also a huge amount of attendance. Um, is that growth continuing at that rate? We have to see that sort of level off and grow at a modest rate. We'd like to focus a little bit more on um, the, the process that we use. Uh, we have started um, using a lot of community leaders and outside instructors. Our librarians still have to uh, plan, they schedule, if they're not teaching or leading it, they shepherd the outside instructor. And then um, the one piece that we really try very hard to do, um, as other organizations do, is to do the follow, to do the measurable, what's the outcome and what's the output. So that all takes time. I, I remember when you did this last year. Yes. And that was the first year that you had Kind of been open, yeah. and I remember that there was a huge spike, and we all, we thought, well, it's sort of the it's the it's the newness factor, right? right. And that's not it like, anymore. This is the demand. But I think it's like if you had actually gone back one more fiscal year and showed. Yes. Oh no, that, that it would it would have been yeah. So it's really not just people coming and checking out the new library anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the library yeah. is now. So these are active yeah. programs. Yeah. They're you know, the steam story times to, you know, um, to. Um, the team programs to the um, the live wires programs, the concerts, all of that. So um, those are just library sponsored programs. So they develop quarterly curriculum. Um, the, the, our staff develop quarterly curriculum. We go out, we, we chase it down, we bring it in, and um, and it's and it's it's causes it's a lot is very busy. <laughs> so that is just the programming side um, of what we do. Uh, each year we do report to the MBLC a whole variety of statistics. It's called our RS State Reporting. I usually just throw the numbers at you, compare it to ourselves, because we're our best competitors. But I thought that here, just to shake it up a little, we might look at, we present within the 370 pub libraries within the Commonwealth. Um, keeping in mind that at the low end of this, you have the South Hadleys, you have the small rural western Massachusetts libraries. Um, but at the top end of this, we've got BPL, Worcester, Field, um, Brookline, Newton. Um, there are 26 or 25 libraries, I think, that are in the 50,000 plus category. We are in the 25 to 50,000. So of the 375, um, 370, the fact that we are in the top basically 7th to 11th percentile of the entire state of what we do, of reference interactions, that's when you come and ask a question or how, how to use my pad or how to download a book to my phone. Total program attendance, direct circul total circulation, total visitors, and total number of programs, you know, that's all within the top 10 or 11 percent um, and upwards. We're very, very busy and we are very competitive. Um, so I love those numbers, <laughs> um, but it also means that, um, you know, we also put a lot of resources into our library, so thank you for, for that. The other thing I want to just quickly point out is our meeting room use continues to grow. It's up 12% over the last year, which that was also exponential because we went from having two meeting rooms to now we have about six or seven. Um, so that is now, that is still continuing to grow in double digits. And, I'm, and we're trying to maximize that as much as we can. I also wanted to just point out, even though it's a moderate growth, 4% um, on our card holders. Um, we do purge if you haven't renewed your card in three years, um, and it ex it's expired or you're, it expires, and then you have a certain amount of time to, to renew that. We do purge a month, but our um, new users are out our our, our lapsed users every every single month. Um, I just checked, and from January to October of just this year, just the calendar year, we're, we have a net increase of 800 li library card holders. So we continue, continue to grow. So every new apartment, um, anything like that, new homes. Um, so we have a lot of card holders. Amy, could I just ask you a quick question on the, yeah. on the how we're ranked? Yes. Are those are we are those ranked uh, for population? 25,500? No, no. 50,000? No, I did that's not. <coughs> that's just the state. That's the entire state. We would be probably closer to, to number, any, like in up to 50,000, so we're in 25 to 49, yeah, 99. Yeah, yeah. We're probably closer to like one through five in all of those. Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, and then keep in mind, we're only at 26 or 27,000. We're on the low end. So, we, you know, we go right up against Andover and, and other communities that are sort of up, up to 40, 30, 40,000. Yeah. So. So we, we hold our own. Um, right. I didn't throw a lot of circulation statistics in here because I don't mm -hmm. want to bore everyone, but um, it is very interesting to me that you know, we've increased our streaming um, and downloadable materials, and that continues to go up. Um, and so our circulation, though, of hard 
physical materials mm -hmm. is going up. Reading is full of readers, believe it or not. They want books. They, they love books. Our physical book circulation continues to creep up. DVD is not so popular. M uh, music CDs, you know, they're dropping as those downloading and streaming services come up. Um, a lot of our online learning services, we have BrainFuse, Learning Express, you can do PSS, PSAT, SAT, all that kind of test prep, that, that use is continuing to go up. But um, in the direct circulation, that's what that direct circulation is, is based mostly just our books. Yeah. So, um, fiscal year 18, um, according to our action plan, which is part of the strategic plan, we've spent uh, most of that year and continuing into this year, our new initiatives were really community-based and really about being um, out in the community um, and bringing all of that together. Um, we had things like the new resident open house, um, teen volunteer and job fair, which is our food truck and uh, music festival. We're continuing to lead the Pulse of Reading community conversations. It's going to be ongoing. Um, we're also out of the building. We had 225 homebound deliveries, so those are people who mm -hmm. can't make it to the library. We also do deposit collections at senior housing and hospice. Our librarians are very busy at all levels of the school, elementary, middle school, and even in high school. Our, our teen librarians are very involved with the book club there. Um, our, our children's librarians are out at RISE. Um, they're out at other private schools doing visits there, promoting early literacy. Um, we're also part of Dementia Friendly in Reading, which Jean mentioned last night. And of course, we're at every town event. One thing I think that is really, um, and Andy mentioned it last night about how the, all the department heads are here. Yeah. It's a very team-based thing. One of the things I think, um, and this is not just the library, is that I think this year in fiscal year 18, we have seen a lot more cross-departmental projects and work and people working together. And I think that is um, an extremely, um, benef it's really beneficial to the town because we couldn't do the things we do. Mm -hmm. I, I, we couldn't do these a lot of these things without the help, or not even help, without partnering and collaborating with other departments in town. So um, I, I think that's a really positive part of what we do. And I, I think I just want to put that on the record is that um, it is a very team-based environment, particularly with the department. So that's good to um, hear. I think yeah. we've worked on a lot of things there. So that's one of the factors, um, one of the other factors that gets us where we are. So my budget summary is pretty simple. As I said, I hoped it was painless. Um, we look at those things. Um, we also look at future planning. And so then um, under the guidance of the Board of Trustees, uh, we do set some goals. And employees, um, the trustees are wonderful. They recognize employees. Our staff is are the essential part of what we do. That without, without our staff, we can do anything um, uh, in the library. So as such, the top priority is always attention and succession planning. That's very, very important. Um, that is why we have a little more emphasis on salaries and wages and a little less emphasis on expenses. Um, additionally, uh, recent events have shown that Reading is a very diverse and changing community. Um, and change is sometimes a little uncomfortable. But we at the library are dedicated to finding uh, better ways to connect with, to listen to, and provide programming for everyone within the community. Um, and we really want to be able to find those who are underserved residents that we are not providing services to. So that's it's a difficult goal. It's, it's, it requires a lot of work. Um, all of this, um, Matt mentioned yesterday about the website and social media. The library does the same thing. We have to spend even more time now than ever uh, working on our communications. There's not only a demand to be transparent and clear, but also there's just so many outlets and people get their information from so many different places that we need to make sure we're covering all the bases. So the communication piece has really just been in importance. Um, so that's content and communications. And also, as I mentioned before, the room reservations um, and working on uh, implementing a control system for meeting room equipment and furniture and just the logistics of that. But we are open 63 hours a week. Um, not all of those, most of those hours are when people would like to use it, become conflict with the library program. So there's there's a whole um, kind of new, uh, new venture there waiting for us with meeting rooms. We're still sort of working our way around that, but it, we, we recognize that as something we need to work with. So the overall increase at ask is 3.25%. However, um, it is broken down more heavily towards a, towards a wage request. So if you have the munis sorts that Bob gave you, it probably looks a little something like this, um, which is um, 
uh, five divisions, administrative, administration, circulation, children's reference, and tech services, and then our expense is going through. I'll go over the weight in a minute. Um, I just wanted to make one point about the expense. Um, and this gets sort of flagged with everybody I've, sh I've shown the budget to. It's like, why is your technology line going down by 37%? Um, it's a technology world out there. Uh, the MBOs has new guidelines. Um, and starting um, this year, you are allowed, it is allowing um, municipalities to allocate up to 10% of the materials budget. That's the materials book tax. We have to spend 14% or 13% of our um, budget on materials. It allows us to spend up to 10% of that budget on direct public use hardware. So that hardware could be a public computer that you use, a laptop, an iPad. It could be adaptive technology that we use to make we're providing you know, low vision services or, or anything like that. So if it's going to direct public use, we can use technology money for that. So, so the, tech, the materials money has gone up <laughs> and the um, technology money has gone down. We still need to have some money in there because we do have staff systems that we use for public service, our RFID technology, scanners, um, pads, and you know things like that. So that's that's really the biggest change in all of our um, expenses. So, any questions about expenses? Am I going too fast? Run on sentence? Um, so, as I said, the wages are going up a little bit more than 3.25. There is actually some ask in there. This is our current org chart. Uh, uh, we currently have an uh, assistant director vacancy. Um, I should actually back up and say, you know, when we started really looking um, at, after, after the override, the override gave us not only Sundays, which was wonderful, it gave us $5,500 for additional hours and staffing, which presumably was Monday through. Your Saturday, and we did sort of a di an initial allocation. But the trustees also asked me and uh, the leadership team, which the division heads and the assistant director at the time, to really go back more closely at how our workflow is really impacted by the new building, automated services, and just the whole the new the new services, the new programs that we're offering. So um, back in September, the assistant director moved on to bigger things, and that kind of sped up the timeline on really looking and, and analyzing what we were doing. So we've taken that time, and um, our first pass when we started before, before the departure of the assistant director, we were able to add uh, points and um, FTE to total of moving on here. There's, we're, we're, we're currently at 21 FTE, which in, uh, that was pretending that there's actually somebody working as an assistant director, uh, being the assistant director position. And um, we added hours in circulation under library associates. There's a little asterisk there you can barely see. Uh, a children's librarian and then adult services librarian on reference services. So we were able to add extra shift hours through that. So that was just taking existing people, giving them more hours. Um, in physical year 18, I just wanted to point this out, actually. Um, we have 30 hours a week of volunteer time, which is immense. We could not do what we do without a volunteer. Um, that volunteer time, is, as great as it sounds, does not include any of the work done by the Friends of Reading Public Library, Reading Public Library Foundation, and it does not include the time put in by our trustees. So this is all above and beyond those volunteers. So we do rely on volunteers, and I just, you know, I'm very thankful that we have these people who kind of pitch in and help out with a lot of the tasks that we need to do. But having said that, um, we, um, I have taken the time to kind of go back and look do, and we have a recommendation. I keep saying we, because if I say we, it doesn't sound like it's my fault. But, um. <laughs> Amy, before you go on to the next slide, yes. could I ask a question on this one? Absolutely. Or, or just maybe drive home a point. You, you, you answered the, the question about what the override provided you, yes. allowed you to do. Um, Sunday hours, more uh, librarian hours, yes. more staff hours. So if, from FY18, I just want to highlight this to FY19, you are only asking for a increase of uh, 0 0.7 FTE? No. Well, yeah, yes. Is that what the plus The plus 0 0.7 are? means that's what we've been able to add. That is what we've added so oh, far. Oh, I see. And then thank you, because I did kind of 
squeeze over that. Um, we were allocated the money, 35,005. Mm -hmm. We have used a portion of that, not all of it, um, to implement point, point 0.7. So we got from, um, we got, as of today, excluding the missing assistant director, we're point 0.7 plus where we were a year from now, a year ago, I mean, sorry, okay. a year ago. I st we still have some thoughts and plans, which takes us to sort of the same chart, um, but not quite. Um, this does include another 0.7 uh, increase request, um, and that's where sort of the 0.89 goes. There are three elements here. Um, the organizational review that we did, and I just wanted to actually say, not the organizational review was not that alone wasn't my fault. This recommendation is, is my fault. What I've taken from the review that um, I, I used in making the decision was to meet with the staff, very specifically with each of the division heads. Um, I've been working with Matt Barrier, who's a trustee as well, and I've also met with Bob and Carol Roberts, and um, they've been all very helpful in this input and in trying to help get a context of what are, what are my resources, where can I where can I grab more more time and and expertise from other departments like IT or facilities, you know, maybe other things that we're doing that we don't need to do. Mm -hmm. So really kind of really drilling down, looking at that, looking at how other departments are structured um, and things like that. So um, it's been a really great exercise. It's, um, but what, one of the things we did realize is that we need to carve some things out. So one is a new position. It's part-time communication specialist. We'll talk about that in a second transfer of one position from a circulation department into um, um, underneath the, the assistant director as a meeting room coordinator. And the final thing that is shown in black up there is um, there is a request, I have a request, to reclass the division heads um, up one grade. Um, the communication specialist is a part-time um, position. We're actually currently looking for one right now, and we're doing it under the, as sort of a temporary part-time, temporary five to six months to kind of get us through the rest of the year position. If it were approved for, for the fiscal year 20 budget, we could turn it into a permanent position. Um, it's 15 hours a week, and it would be someone very specifically to help out in administration with communication efforts. Um, it's a specialized skill set. It's not a librarian job. It's not a technical cataloging, classifying type job. Um, we need it to help improve the accessibility to our services. We can offer as many services as we want, but if we can't get it to the people that need it, it doesn't do, it doesn't do anybody anything. <coughs> so it's, it's an identified need. The other piece um, is that right now, the meeting rooms are maintained or managed primarily through, because there's nothing there if you want to think about it, I guess, it's through our circulation division, which is not really appropriate. Um, we want to move that into, admin into administration under the assistant director. We need a meeting room coordinator to do a lot of the clerical <coughs> staff and things like that. Plus, we are open 60 hours and then 63 in the in the in the winter time. One person working 37 hours a week is just it's just not enough to kind of manage all of that. So we want to move that all into under administration. That's why there was such a big jump in the administration salaries. We chunked people over there. Um, it's a response to immediate need. It's not a new hire. It's just trans um, an existing staff member. So those are the first two staffing changes um, that this budget uh, recommends. So there's no elimination of these here. And one of the things we did is once I realized we were going to start moving what the responsibilities of the assistant director are, which, since there's no elimination of duties, we have to redistribute some duties, which got me back to looking at um, what exactly it is our division heads do. One of the things that came across with our division heads um, they are, first of all, we always want to be competitive. That's, and, and uh, Carol Roberts is great. She helped me work out some uh, of the peer groups and the other groups that we're working with where our folks are. Um, one of the things I think we've discovered in general is that where our folks are, sort of the lower and the middle are okay. They're capped a little shorter than other of our peer communities. So that was just sort of a little bit of a red flag. So I want to make sure that we remain competitive in the actual salary classification. Um, but what really jumped out to me, and I think um, to some other folks, was that our librarians and, our, and their division heads, their direct supervisors, are too close together. 
So um, they're basically one step apart. So there is not really much of a financial incentive for someone to want to go to a promotion because they get a whole lot more responsibility, manage six or seven people, be responsible for a budget, be exempt, not get any overtime, come to night meetings for less than 3% of a, of, a, of a raise or increase because the, the, the they're too close together. So um, the reclass that I'm recommending and I've talked to Bob about it, requested, uh, respectfully requested for the selectman, um, and, and is budgeted for, so hopefully would be uh, approved by town meeting, would bring the division heads from a grade G up to a grade H. They would receive really basically a less than 2% raise and then get whatever COLA or whatever comes on top of that. So um, that's, it just makes sense um, to me at least. So um, that is the, that is the um, gist of the salary change. If you look at your Munis account, one thing that's not noted on this slide, if you look at the Munis reports, and I know FinCom you guys look at this very closely, you will see that there is a significant jump, or it's a big number for the assistant director position. Um, that is a placeholder. We do not have a candidate yet. We are rewriting the job description. I have placed that salary at the high end in case when we go out, having sat around at the department head meetings and heard about all these people that get offered a job and then reject it because <laughs> because they would like to make more money in whatever town that's offering a better salary. I That is a little artificially inflated. It says like a 10% increase or something like that. It's artificially inflated and it's a worst case scenario if we were just absolutely desperate. But we are changing what the responsibilities are. We are making sure that it's a... Um, to back up for the assistant director, so we want to make sure that it's compensated. I would hope that we could hire someone for less than that. Um, but we'll, when we get to that, we'll cross that bridge. So I didn't want anyone to panic when they saw that. Any questions about the staffing? So, uh, but on the assistant director, uh, I think on the first slide, they weren't managing anybody, were they? But now they'd be managing two people. Yes. So, that's and that's or, and that's or two positions. The, I don't know. Exactly. I mean, I, I think I think there's some there's arguments both ways. Right. Part of um, even though the assistant director did not manage any anything, they do the the, the professional and not the supervisory, but the actual management, meaning their responsibility. <coughs> and right. like when I'm not here, their responsibility is, is quite high. So. Um, but now they now they now they actually will right. also have so, supervisory right. positions. So it, that's that's why that's a little bit of a. Uh, hi, Mark. Sorry, I'm hiding in the corner. That's okay. Can you go back to your summary slide just for a second? Uh, I'm thing? not sure. That one? No. Uh, no, the financial summary. The financial summary. Look at that. That one? Yes. So you on the uh, on your target three and a quarter, you're coming in at three and a quarter. I'm coming in at three and a quarter as my target, and I've I've weighted wages a little bit. Yep. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. However, I always end it um, as with tradition um, to maybe look at the investment that you make into the library. Um, this is a fairly standard. On the right, you have a chart that shows the approximate. We can argue about whether how accurate it is, whether an ebook actually costs fifteen dollars or not. Um, but um, their approximate calculator, the chart on the left, doesn't even begin to cover absolutely everything that we do. But it's based strictly on our circulation. So we circulated uh, one hundred and eleven thousand four hundred thirty-three books, adult books, and at a cost of seventeen bucks. That's a value of X, Y, or Z. So in fiscal year eighteen, uh, the town invested. Um, $1.5 million into the operating costs of the library, so raise some expenses. And the net benefit, well, not, well the net benefit is, is about $5 million. The, the growth was about $6.5 million. So um, even though there may be people who don't use the library or visit the library, the people who do get an incredible return on their investment. So I mean, it is always a good bet. So anything we can do to support that is appreciated. Any, any questions? Actually, you didn't add the volunteer hours. Actually. I not. That's a whole so other person. That's, 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 a, that's a person. Yeah, a that's year. almost person. Yeah, right. I so. mean, it is, they are people. That is almost an <laughs> FTE. They, that is an FT, <laughs> Almost an FTE. Right. Yes. Right. So that um. that the town is getting the benefit of correct. Um, correct. No expenditure. Yeah. So. so thank you for your time. Um, okay. Oh, unless there are any other questions. Dan. No. Good. So <clears throat> the only comment 
or the, the you know, this is um, the select board's chance to um, yes. <clears throat> to work with the town manager uh, before he hibernates, as we said yesterday. Um, this this budget was approved by the board of library trustees. This is their essentially, and yes. Yeah. So so um, I just want to I'd like to respect it as much as we can mm -hmm. in the budget process because they are like us are an elected board. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just my two cents. Yeah. So yes, and the directives that I I do receive. No, they were not with me when I was like doing all the spreadsheets mm -hmm. and everything. So, but I do take my directives from them, and they are very supportive and and of of the mission of the library. And as I mentioned, it, the the focus on the staff. And and I, I'm even going. Bob mentioned this is an easy year to do it, but going back, I don't know, at least six or seven years that I've been attending the budget things. Every single one, every single time we've gone, it's been about the people and it's been about the salaries and it's always been the wish list that's been so hard to get. And um, you know, this is still. We were very lucky in the override. We really appreciate every penny we have. We're using the new plan. We'll use every penny plus the little teeny, 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 tiny. Yeah. So that's a very official term. Um, it's not part of the budget, um, but it also shows a lot of support of the town. Can you talk just a little bit about the role of the friends? Yep. the role of the foundation sure. and, what, and, 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 and how they support the library? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So the library is um, fortunate enough to have two uh, two financially financial support groups. Um, traditionally, the Friends of the Reading Public Library is a fundraising arm that provides money for the programming. So the 843 programs that you saw there, the only funding that went into those in fiscal year 18 to those programs were the salary portion of, of the budget. Anytime the librarians spent, the staff spent, scheduling, planning, whatever. The actual implementation pro of the programs, the friends have usually give us about anywhere from thirty dollars to $40,000 to implement those programs. And that's paying, you know, so many thousand dollars to have a, um, uh, visiting author. We had Javaka Steptoe, I don't know if you remember, he was a Caldecott winning author. He came in and he um, did a whole bunch of work at the, at the elementary schools. We brought him to the elementary schools. We always bring an author and they come to the middle schools. We had Giles LaRoche who did our artist in residence. And um, actually, was that actually this? Yeah, that was just clear 18, I think it's 18, 19, 20. Um, came in and did, we did a whole, portrait of the town basically made out of paper I can't explain it you have to come to the library and see it so all of those programs where we are paying outside professionals and things like that or buying donuts for the you know the coffee and donuts program that is not paid out of taxpayer dollars this current year we did receive a small amount for programming and we are we are using that but the you know it's not over near 30 or 40 thousand dollars that we use so that's what the friends do the foundation has that we're working on endowment um, and and they continue to raise that the foundation's role is really more on some large capital programs they had done before the building program they had done large capital improvements replacing entire rugs providing all the first computers for the computer lab kind of large chunk things and they continue to support us in that way um, it does mean that you know not only do we have a new building and won't have, should not have any capital asks for a while, um, but then when we do, we have we have some alternatives. Maybe we can ask half of it from the town and from the foundation or something like that. Um, so that 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 is what the foundation does. So they, those are both fundraising. One is really more long term, um, and one is more short term. So that's what they do. But they do they uh, they provide a significant amount of money. And also. Um, the state aid this year we'll, we will receive a little over thirty-two thousand dollars in state aid, so that goes on top of of this, and we use that for um, our professional development. The professional development number is about if you combine the travel and um, you know we, we, we pay dues for all of our librarians to belong to professional organizations. If they are if they do have their MLS, they are required to do professional development and attend a conference and/or workshops. Um, 
we do try to get them out and learning sort of what are the new technologies, what are the trends um, in adult education, children's education, and young adult education. So we can't afford that on our regular professional development. We pay, we use state aid for all of that. State aid pays for all of our marketing and printing and advertising and things like that. So, so we do use other resources. Uh, Amy, uh, a comment and then uh, a request. Okay. Uh, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I, I think uh, that you made a compelling argument for the salaries. Uh, with the managers having <coughs> a bigger step mm -hmm. to create, to incentivize um, staff to move up mm -hmm. vertically within the organization. That's key to any retention plan. Um, Vanessa came in a little late. Uh, would you mind just going back over the room usage and? No, no, no I'll, I'll catch it later. You sure? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. She's in the library all the time. Okay. Uh -huh. That's true. All right. <laughs> okay. Just a uh, walk over. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, just a series of quick hits. Yes. Of course, you don't have anything around. That's good. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that because we hit a certain population threshold. Yes. The library materials budget requirements now 13 percent. That's mm -hmm. down from 15. Down from 15. Okay. Yes. So the but trustees, the trustees, um, unless they vote differently at next week's meeting, um, are still supporting a 14 percent base. 14 yes, it is now 14 percent. Um, sorry, this is jumping over. That's all right. The, I, the active card holders number around 22,000. I know it's kind of weird. But it's true. <laughs> I, I called Noble. I was like, "Are you not purging our, mm. our, you know?" Granted, there could be people that are that have moved out, and we're not going to catch them for like three, three and a half. There is a lag time, but I mean, more honestly, I'd say the active card, the active card holders are closer to about thirteen thousand, which is still really darn high. That's mm -hmm. my question. Yeah, half the town. Yeah, no, it's half the town. Yeah, it's half the town. Yeah. So, um, how do you measure total visitors? Oh, we have a door counter. Okay. Yeah. So that one. That one is a lot easier yeah. than you think. Okay. So, um, the unbound deliveries, mm -hmm. it, it works out to be about one a day if it's just weekdays, right? Yeah. So, yesterday, um, Gene was talking about like, with elder services, the, the, yeah. the demographics and the increasing um, elderly population in yeah. town. Uh, is, has that number been increasing? Or it's been continue? increasing slowly, but on, honestly, it, this is a really compassionate town, and I find um, we do have a lot of close relationships. We, we actually, um, our elder services librarian like works very close with Jane Burns over at Elder Services, and um, we we do have a lot of family arrangements. So we find a lot of. Um, I'm here for my mom, and I'm gonna. I'm, I'd like to do this. Could she have an extended loan? I might not be able to get back to her. That kind of thing. So we do we do a lot of accommodations on that end of it. On, on that end of it, um, the homebound folks are people who truly don't have anyone. Um, who can get, you know, who yeah. can come in for them. But we find there's a lot of um, intergenerational family support, which I find very heartening. Mm -hmm. um, either either people are aging, you know, in their home and they have people living with them, or, um, you know, they actually have family coming from outside of town. And this is my mom's library and she really wants to get this book and this audio book or whatever. So um, it has grown um, and I think it will continue to grow. I think that is one of the things, however, that I feel is that we can do more of a, a better job um, getting out there. The homebound service is not for permanently homebound people. If you are home for, you know, a set of six months due to a medical condition and you are unable to do that, you may you can apply. It's completely free. It's one of one of the big uses of our volunteers are people driving around town, dropping off and picking up picking up items. And it's something that is particularly sensitive. We deal with a lot of private information. Everybody has to be quarried. We don't share what they check out. Um, so you know we're it's it's a big trust kind of um, project and it's something that we're very proud of not every library does it um, so I think it's something that will grow but it's something that I don't know that everybody in that needs group understands and have that service and then one more if you I like this by the way it'd be interesting to see that over time this, this yes thing. but could you go back to where you had it the rankings for a number of um, yeah exactly so as you think about say total number of you know, reference interactions mm -hmm. or circulation, and you put that up against your staffing model. Are there are there benchmarks or, or averages like 
you know, uh, reference interactions per reference librarian at, at our library yeah. versus others? Um, and are there are there areas? It's very difficult. That and, are you know, I, uh, the part of the reason I, I actually almost didn't include this. I went. I was just going to do like, oh, we did last year, we did this year. Um, but I do think it's impressive. I think the hardest part is that um, it's so diverse in the range of what we do. So it's hard to compare ourselves to other libraries, first of all, because. Um, our staffing model, um, how do I say this? Our staffing model is very librarian heavy. There are other libraries that have uh, more of a clerk, clerical assistant kind of model, so they're very strong, sort of at the lower levels, and then it gets pointier, pointier, pointier. We have a very strong MLS professional librarian level. I think that is um, great because it allows us to do, you know, these people are educators, they're, they're, you know, they're actually developing curriculum, they're selecting materials, curating collections. I, it's hard for me to compare that to a library that doesn't have that level of staff at every single desk. So it's possible, I mean, I think you're asking me within my library, within my, do I, do I, do I strive for a number? No, I don't. I, I guess what I'm asking is, is, you know, I don't know which ones of those are really trending. And, and oh. as, you, as you look ahead a year or two. Oh, or looking year, ahead? Uh, you know, um, uh, just using the reference one as an example. Yeah. If, if that one's really trending, you see, are we going to need another reference you know, library in a, in a year or two? Oh, just kind of oh that kind of thinking. program. Okay, that, I'm with That's you. the kind of question Sorry. I'm asking. Catching up. Um, honestly, no. Um, I think, I think, in, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, honestly, in good conscience, I would say no. Um, I think, and I think we could always use extra. I think if you just said, oh, here's the magic fairy, could you, could, could you use three full-time staff members? I would say absolutely, 100%, I could put them to use, and it would, it would ease up a lot. Having said that, um, I, I think what's, what I'm seeing more is a change in what we do and how we do it, not who, not who is doing it. And, and that change within the staffing model that we have. So we have, uh, this, we looked at our automated systems. Um, our automated systems are accounting for 50 to 6 percent of our, of our circulation work. Okay, that's great. Reduces repetitive stress, stress syndrome and all of that stuff. What we do is redeploy those library assistants to doing other tasks. Doing other, those other tasks allow the librarians some more space to do their planning and their teaching and things like that or curating. So it, there's, it's a trickle up effect, kind of. So I would like to see more uses of technology. I don't think we physically need more, more people in the building to, to do the job necessarily. I think we kind of have that unless the town, I mean, maybe at 30,000 we're gonna be okay, but if for some reason the town were to suddenly sh shoot up and we had all sorts of more, that's a whole nother ball game, but it's a whole nother ball game for everybody else in this room too. Yeah. So the current projections, I, I truly think in good conscience, I think that we would be okay with what I'm asking Well, for. you plan for the building that way. Yes, so. yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but you know, that's, that this allows us to have staff, it allows us to have full staff staffing on three floors of the library, 63 hours a week. And that is essentially what we want. Um, if you threw an extra librarian at me, yeah, I could probably make 900 programs a year, maybe maybe 950. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm, I think I'm more concerned about quality right now. I think right now we're ready to slow down a little bit and look at the quality of what we're doing, um, and then kind of revisit that in a little bit. So if that makes any sense. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Thanks Thank you very much, Amy. Fire Chief, and I have with me Assistant Chief Paul Jackson. So I thought tonight I'd uh, go over a little bit about what the department does, um, also uh, how we're organized, uh, some of our response data, and uh, where we are with the hiring and training process, uh, and um, some, some budget changes. 
we're not looking for any more additional people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the slides uh, I put in, it's a little misleading because we, we, we haven't um, hired uh, the, the firefighters that were authorized before, so I'll, I'll go through that process. Four major functions were fire suppression, fire prevention, uh, the emergency medical system, and uh, emergency management. Uh, we're also responsible to coordinate and apply for all federal disaster de declarations, and you'll see later on that um, that's, that's resulted in a lot of additional uh, money coming back to the community uh, for, for our responding to uh, natural disasters. Uh, this is a slideshow in the structure of our department. Primarily, we're organized around the, the four groups. You see the bottom, uh, groups one, two, three, and four. Every day, a, a, a different group is, is working. Uh, there's a captain and a lieutenant assigned to each group, and between eight and nine firefighters right now. When we get fully up to staff, there'll be ten firefighters on each group. We also have a captain uh, in charge of uh, fire prevention, and um, and we also have three part-time fire alarm technicians. It sounds uh, kind of big, but the, their, their budget um, this fiscal year is $15,000 in salary. So, so they, they're not working a tremendous amount, and they don't make an awful lot of money. They make less than uh, what they do working as a firefighter, doing the fire alarm work. But they keep our fire alarm system up and running, and it's an important system to us. Um, and we also have, um, you'll see emergency medical services, we have an EMS coder and an EMS liaison. They're both firefighters, they're both assigned to uh, one of the groups down below. They work on our EMS system when they're in the building. They do have to come back uh, for overtime to keep our, to keep our system up, uh, go to the hospital, get medication, um, and, and follow up and do training and follow up on, on other things. The oversight of our EMS um, program is, is really critical. Uh, and you'll, you'll see as we get into the presentation how, how much, how, what, what they're actually doing a little bit. So um, this is our, um, this, this is how our, uh, we're, we're currently at. Uh, so right now in FY19, even though we're authorized for 40 friends, we only, we're, we're down to 35. Um, so we, we are short five physicians right now. And uh, we're in the process of uh, laying them. The process to hire a, uh, a firefighter starts with us um, sending in a request to uh, civil service, to um, the Human Resources Division. Uh, they get that list out to us, and they turn it around to us uh, fairly quick. They email the kids um, that are on the list and uh, they have seven days to come in and sign the list indicating that they're willing to accept a position. When we, um, when we know who we have, we, we set up interviews for the, for the candidates. And then uh, we make our selections and there's a uh, background check, a reference check. After that's done, we have to send them for a medical evaluation and it has to meet a certain criteria. And then um, after they pass the medical, they're eligible to take the civil service physical abilities test. That's offered every two weeks, so twice per month. They have the ability to watch that before they take that. So sometimes it can take uh, a month before they've, they've gone through this, maybe a little bit longer. And then once we have our candidate go through all that steps, and we have that, uh, that, that paperwork, their name, social security number, I can submit that to the Massachusetts Firefighting Academy, and then they'll give us a, 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 a slot. Or, and uh, right now the backlog is six months. So it's, it's a long process for us. So we uh, requested a list in, in June uh, for, for our five positions. We received um, approximately 90 eligible names. It was about six or seven pages of names. Out of that, six people signed that they'd be willing to accept a position with us. Out of those six that signed, five of them appeared for the interview. We interviewed, every, we interviewed all the candidates and we selected one candidate. Um, and uh, that person had to go through the medical and PAT process 
and then I was able to get an academy, but it was a six months wait, so they're not going to the academy until uh, April. Um, the list that that um, we hired that person on was at the end of its life, and it, it's a, it's expired, and obviously there wasn't very much interest. I don't want to say picked over, but it's there wasn't much. Uh, there wasn't much interest um, for our department. So the, there is a new list um, that should be coming out within the next day or so, uh, a couple of days or a week when our civil service is going to release it. We filed our paperwork for our um, uh, positions uh, back in the summertime, so I'm optimistic I'll see that shortly. Our end is to, once we, we get that, is to really fast track it and, and get candidates um, hired, good candidates. It's really important for us to hire the right people to, We could go out and hire somebody, but if, if you hire the wrong person, it's, it's, it's not good for the organization. But our, 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 our plan is to fast track as much as we can to stay within our, stay within our process. I have to meet a uh, period of performance for, uh, from FEMA for the SAFER grant that, we, that I have to have those people hired by February 23rd. Uh, the fire academy will give you slots based upon um, safer. You, I don't have to give them the name and social security number if you've got a safer. Net. I requested that back in the summertime, and I got slots for May. So um, it's it's a it's a long process for us to get to get people in. What we're saying, I had a conversation with the state fire marshal this this week, and he was telling me that the. Um, only about four, th a little over four thousand candidates took the exam uh, to be a firefighter statewide, and there was, um, I think he said, um, around three hundred or so of those candidates were paramedics. So we don't have a big pool of people that are taking the test, and we don't have a big pool of paramedics. And we have a lot of communities that are looking to, to hire paramedics. For us, it's important that we do hire paramedics because the the cost to train them is very high. And the paramedic skills is, it, it's not something you can just train anybody to do. You have to be interested in it yourself and, and be curious about it and want to improve. And it, it's not something you just want to take somebody off the street, run them through a program and say, okay, you're good, off you go. Because we're giving people medications and the worst, you know, yeah. and, and, and some very serious things. We can't afford mistakes. So you want people that are invested into that uh, training program. Yeah. Chief, before you, before you go on, maybe, maybe go back to the last slide. Sure. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I always thought, like, you know, getting on a fire department was something that a lot of people really wanted to do. Yet you were given a list, a large number of lists, and only six folks wanted to come to Reading. Am I understanding that? So yeah. is there a rationale why um, out of that list, so only a small number of people that wanted to come here? Is it something about us, the way we pay, the way we're structured? They went elsewhere, they weren't interested anymore. And then out of that, we only got one. So that that's kind of <coughs> there's troubling. A, there's, a, there's a couple of things with that. Uh, one is that that's a statewide list, so there's people all over the state. So there okay. were people that didn't live in this area. Okay, got it. Uh, there were people on that, that list that did get picked up in other departments. Um, uh, so, you know, you, there's a lot of different reasons. The, the numbers of people taking the test is down, and I think part of the reason is the cost. They have to actually pay to take it. Years ago, you could take it for nothing, and it went up to like $10, $20. And now I want to say it's $150? I think it's a little bit more. Maybe more. So people are just taking that kind of on a whim now. So that's really knocked those numbers down. Dan? Yeah. Uh, Chief, uh, the town talked about the civil service versus non-civil service for the police several years ago. And they opted out of the process. Correct. Uh, has the fire department ever considered reinvestigating the pros and cons of staying in civil services? First question. Secondly, uh, is there a what, you know what percent of fire departments are in, in the state in civil versus not? 
I don't know what the percentage is. There's a lot in our area that are. Yeah. There, there are some that have moved out of it. We've talked to the union about it. Um, you know, it's some, that's really a subject for, for, for bargaining. Um, to, you know, you want to, you, know, you, you want to do that in a cooperative uh, sure. fashion. The police did it, so they, they bargained yeah. it out. And I think that's the appropriate way to do it. Um, but we have over the years had discussions with them over it. Um, so. But there's a, there's a lot of different reasons why, you know, end of a list, we got a statewide list, and uh, things like, things like I, that. I'm not advocating pilfering for another town, but if, let's say there's a firefighter that, you know, is in the, in the central part of the state and his family is moving, mm -hmm. and he or she is already a trained firefighter. I'm assuming they don't have to go through the academy and the civil service process because they already have done that. And, you know, is, is there opportunities to kind of... Yeah. Look we, at people who are already trained, maybe yeah. in a different department, but yeah, we do have people that come to us. Uh, we have hired people from other departments. Um, we uh, generally what we do is we uh, run them through the same process that we have for a new hire, and because when you short, when you shorten a process, kind of that's when it comes back and bites you. So we run them through the same process, and then we. Um, and then after an interview with the town manager, we make a decision whether whether or not that candidate's right for us. Okay. But, but it's always something that, um, that that we keep our minds open to. And we, and we do get calls on the occasion. How, how does that process interact with the civil service process? So um, say you you had more than you know five on the list, um, and say you had more that were willing to accept. Um, would you have to go with the candidates who scored the highest who were willing to accept? Is that the way the civil service yes. process works? And then if, you, if, if, that, if there were matches there um, that filled the department's need, would you be able to look at um, uh, sort of lateral transfers from other towns? So, if there, so say we're in a position where we need to hire four firefighters. So if I requested a list for four firefighters, at a minimum, we're entitled to two times the number of vacancies plus one. So we're entitled to look at nine people. Okay. So if so, so if somebody that came out they they wanted to transfer to us and we wanted to hire them, then we'd be hiring three people. So we'd be able to look at seven candidates. So we'd we'd go down the list and we'd be able to select from the uh, top seven names. If there are ties. Uh, um, Within the um, say the last person is a, is a tie, we can look at all of those names. And sometimes there is a tie where, where now you, instead of having seven names, now you have uh, twelve or something like that. Now, if you if you you're supposed to hire an order, if you don't hire an order, you have to give a reason why, and it has to meet a certain criteria. So there has to be um, legitimate reasons why you're not, not taking a candidate higher than another candidate. And uh, that's subject to an appeal. The candidate being bypassed can appeal that, that decision. So if you, if, you, um, if you do that, it's something that you have to have legitimate reasons for, and you really have to document that well, because it can be overturned by a civil service hearing. But we've, we've done it. It's, it's, a, it's a process. Yes. A question from the back. Um, you mentioned that there's a lot more demand for paramedic uh, trained firefighters. Correct. Is that happening around us and surrounding towns? The reason I'm asking is that when we get into a mutual aid situation, mm -hmm. are we getting paramedic trained firefighters coming in mostly, or is it kind of? It depends on where they come from. So, in, if they're coming from North Reading, yes. If they're coming from Linfield, yes. If, if they're coming from Wilmington, no. Wolverine, no. Stoneham, no. Wakefield, no. Um, a little bit about our emergency response data. Uh, so this is a, a look at 2016, 2000, 2016, 17, and 18 partial data, just the first 11 months of the year. So you can see our, our responses are going up. Um, and this is emergency responses for, for uh, the calendar year. In, a, in, a, in the dark um, column, you're right, that's our partial response. So, we're, we're going to be higher than um, 2017 uh, when 2018 is over. 
This is just fire response has taken the EMS part out. That's also increasing as well. Um, you see how it's just stair staircasing upward. And again, on the, on the right uh, dark column is um, 2018 project data to December 1st. This is our uh, total emergency response. If you look a kind of a pie about what, what, what we do, um, if you can see a lot of stuff. What we do is, is EMS. But it's a, it's a little deceiving because I broke out the fire side and a little, lot of different reasons for the call, whether it be an electrical problem, um, investigating uh, gas odor, um, alarm activations, and, and things like that, uh, structure fires. Uh, this is EMS responses by calendar year. It, it looks a little up and down, but the trend is, uh, you can see in 2013, 15, and seeing the trend is um, uh, to increase. Chief, why are why do the numbers year to year vary so much? Like the 15 to 2016. Well, well from, no, it's not that really. Yeah, well, the well, because we're looking at oh, a little bit of a snapshot the graph, in the graph. Yeah. Coming off the bottom yeah. of the bars. You're right. Yeah. yeah. The tall bars. So there should be a little. Uh, a little. Bit. Okay, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Is that never mind. Never mind. <laughs> uh, this is a this is a real un unfortunate uh, slide showing the Narcan administration uh, for 2017, uh, 24 administrations in uh, 2002, <laughs> partial uh, 2022. How successful have those been? Can you say Narcan? Yeah, it uh, it, knows. it works. Uh, it, it it works. Uh, a lot of times the patient has other other drugs on yes. uh, that they've taken. So they have to be very careful how they give it. Yeah. Um, they, if you give too much of it, you can cause the patient to, to seize. Mm -hmm. So they, they give it just enough to, to, um, to start the respiratory drive. Yeah. And so they're very, they're very careful how they, how they give it. But they, they've had 24 successful resuscitations in the 24 I can't say that Something that's like re that. successful res uh, They've resuscitated successfully, but they've, they've given it yeah. that many times. I think a lot of people think of Narcan administration somewhat like AEDs. They're kind of everywhere. You can pick one up, use it, read the directions. Is this something a person generally should not administer unless they've had the proper training, or is it possible? Well, to... they can't. Uh, generally, yeah. the layperson's given nasal Narcan, okay. and uh, it's not as, in fact, not as effective as, as yeah. giving it as our paramedics do a lot is, uh, uh, intravenously because it just takes longer. You know, it, a lot of it will come right out of the nose if the nose is stuffed up, you know. It, and it also takes a uh, several minutes to uh, to work. Sometimes a layperson, the big mistake is, you know, they'll give it and they'll expect immediate result, and they'll just keep giving it. You know, it's just a natural reaction. Just keep giving it until it works. You know, but you can give them too much, and instead of what what they'd like to see happen is get that respiratory drive going, and not not send them into a seizure. <coughs> Uh, patient age by uh, demographics, you can see 55 and older is uh, a significant um, for business. It's more than the other uh, age groups combined. Is that shifting? Is it shifting higher and higher year, year to year? I didn't, I, Mark, I haven't looked at it that way, but I can tell you, you know, that elderly, the elderly we see an awful, uh, see an awful lot. And there's a lot of reasons for people living older, you know, people are living alone more. Um, uh, people's, uh, you know, immediate family have moved. You know, so there's a lot of reasons why, why we see them. Do you, you have percentages of the total cohort, in other words, of all people in those age groups? How many does this represent as a percentage? Do you have that data? Is this, this could be uh, skewed a little depending on... I, that's almost yeah. half. That's oh, uh, the nine side, it's almost half? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is um, our EMS responses for calendar year 2017. You can see some of our higher call volumes for uh, difficulty breathing. Um, psychiatric uh, emergencies, that's definitely on the increase. Um, uh, falls, allergic reaction, and uh, traffic and transportation, motor vehicle accidents, uh, is uh, 
a lot of a high percentage of what we're doing. Is the psychiatric uh, problem and abnormal behavior is that tied to substance related? It could be issues. It could be. It could be a, a lot of different reasons for it, but that that would be. Do you know what the uh, at the, psych the psychiatric and um, behavioral? Do you have those statistics broken down by age group? Is that is that mostly kids and people in their twenties? Is it? It's all elderly? ages now. I mean, it's, it's all ages. Is, um, is there any? I don't have any data here in my presentation, but it would be interesting to look at. Um, I, I I believe our system could pull that data out by looking at that specific specific one. But I can tell you, just you know, listening to the calls, that they're it's a wide it's a wide group that they're responding to. I know you can't read this, <laughs> but um, this is uh, what's interesting about this this slide is. I just wanted to show you all the different medications our firefighters can give, and that they can give those right in the patient's home or in the in the car or wherever wherever they need it. So it's 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 kind of interesting to see um, how, what their capability is. What is? It's oh, the second oh, one. Odonesetron. Yes. What is that? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Albuterol for for breathing. Yeah, uh, nitroglycerin also for, for, for chest pain, pills for, for pain medication, preventers for uh, breathing issues. You can see Narcan. And Narcan is, is up there, and you can see the, the, all the medications that give Narcan is, is up there. Uh, here's, here's a couple of our, our paramedics training on the uh, simulation mannequins. It's uh, Steve Benary on the left and uh, uh, Eric uh, Berlou on the, on the right. The, those uh, mannequins were received uh, last year, and they're very sophisticated. They're computer controlled. They, um, they can cry. They can moan. They can, uh, they can sweat, vomit. They respond to the medications given. So they give a medication. If it's the wrong medication, the, then the patient deteriorates. So, so it, it, um, they can intubate them, so they can uh, practice routine skills such as airway, maintaining a, a patent airway, and they can um, uh, practice skills that they call HALO, um, high acuity, low occurrence, so they build that, uh, emergency, that immediate response to uh, real critical patients. So it's something that has really enabled our people to up their training and up their game. It's, they're used um, regularly in the, uh, in the fire station uh, quarterly as mandated by uh, our uh, medical control physician uh, for everybody to, to go through for airway uh, management and also part of our refresher training. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a big uh, boost to our training. It's like a salsa anti on steroids? <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> medical schools use these to train their medical students. It, they're that sophisticated. And, um, uh, uh, Channel, Channel, 5, Channel 25 News, Fox News, uh, did a quick little segment on it um, about, <coughs> about four weeks ago. Uh, this, this slide shows our uh, first line uh, fire apparatus. Each, each one of those is uh, registered as an ambulance. Fire trucks are registered as class five ambulances so we can carry all the medications that you saw around there in ALS supplies. Nobody else around us is, is doing that. So if, the, if somebody has a medical emergency, the ladder truck rolls up because the, the um, ambulance is at Winchester Hospital with another patient, they're treated immediately. We're not waiting for Linfield or North Reading to come. So it's a huge, uh, level of uh, service for the community that nobody else is providing in this general area. Gee, that's a really important message to kind of get out there because, um, you know, common complaint here is, oh my God, there's a little fender bender and they brought the la you know the ladder truck. I mean, yeah, you know, you're o over. It's overkill. But you don't know what you're going to see when you get to that fender bender, oh, and, that, and that's an ambulance. So I think that the, the, that's that's important education and messaging because. Um, You'd rather have you rather have the ladder truck come out than nothing. Absolutely, yeah. So. yeah. And then sometimes we just need people to help carry, right? Carry the patient here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just call the finance committee. Sure. Thank you. 
Yeah, on that, Chief, um, there are times when you send out a couple vehicles to it is, homes yep. and, and houses, and, and uh, that's not an, you've, you don't need to go over it. You've explained it to me, and I think others pretty well, but that's not an overkill. There's a real reason there is, yeah. for, for doing that. Yeah. Uh, fire prevention, everybody's doing fire prevention. Uh, I, I just want to show you some uh, fire prevention numbers. Uh, we have a fire prevention officer that does routine inspection, does, does uh, you know, the businesses and uh, commercial inspections and, and resident, some residential ones. And, um, and, but the shifts do a lot of uh, inspections too. I just want to show you some of, the, some of the, our inspection numbers. Um, over the, over the calendar year. So we're quite busy doing inspections, you know, on average over uh, 1,000 thousand per year. And that can be oil burner installations, uh, tank installations, uh, smoke detectors, um, and then uh, commercial things, and liquor license inspections, and, and other things. School inspections, uh, group homes. Uh, emergency management. Uh, that's, that's a that's a component of the project that's, that is, is really important to the town, and it's gaining an importance. It's really gained an importance over, over the years. Um, one of the reasons is that if you don't have all of your, uh, if we don't have all our ducks in a row for for the federal requirement, we're not eligible for the for the FEMA reimbursement. So they have come, um, you know, it's almost like every other year. Some years we've we've gotten uh, two. Um, and it's worth a significant amount of money to the community. Since 2001, we've received the Town of Reading and Reading Municipal Light Department um, just under $1.4 million. We're currently working on a uh, reimbursement for the March uh, snowstorm and all the, the wires and things came down. Reading lights, each one, uh, the disasters declared differently. Sometimes uh, municipal light departments are included, sometimes they're not. This time they're included, so it should be on the higher end. The, the one, the 2012 snowstorm, that Reading light was included into that um, with their service area that really, uh, uh, really uh, resulted in a lot of uh, money coming back to the town. Uh, one thing we're working on right now is a, uh, a new comprehensive receipt plan. There's a boilerplate that we received from uh, MEMA. Uh, we've, we've updated that and customized that for Reading. But the next phase is to have over 20 different annexes for, for, different, for different things. Our cotton of operations plan um, uh, right down to uh, for, for health department to do mass inoculations and distribution of um, other uh, medications and things. So each each uh, there's going to be an answer for each one of those components and allow us to to update that. So we'll be presenting that to, to the board. It's something in the next few months. Uh, the next thing that's that's coming down the that, that's kind of important to us is uh, there was a law law passed. Uh, that put fire departments under OSHA requirements throughout the, throughout the state. That's new to us, so we have to comply with those. That takes effect February 1st. So we're working on that now. It's going to result in some cost to us. We have to uh, fit test everybody for the respirator a uh, year. Um, uh, there's also some medical evaluations to make sure people are safe to wear respirators. Uh, some new procedures on when they're up on top of a fire truck uh, to prevent uh, falls. Uh, it has a workplace uh, inspector so they come do an inspection of the fire station, make sure that uh, that it's safe, and uh, also accident investigation. So right now, the information on on what the requirements is is a little murky. Uh, there's there's stuff that's out of um, uh, DLF Department of uh, Labor Standards and from the uh, State Fire Marshal's office, and so. We've taken that preliminary information. We're working on that uh, as best. And as, as we get the information, we'll be working on our plan to, to be in compliance. It's not something that we uh, want to be out of compliance. So it's going to uh, jump into the into the budget. Um, it, uh, no real significance from uh, FY19 budget. Uh, the um, non-union personnel uh, budgeted to go up 3.25 percent as as directed by the town manager. Uh, if you look at our senior administrative assistant line item, we've combined the salaries of a full-time and a half-time position, so that that number's jumped. 
Um, we increased fire alarm hours by $5,000. It's a jump to that. The union salary increases are estimated since we don't have a signed collective bar the bargain agreement with the um, with the union right now, but we have um, we have estimates of what, it, what it's going to cost and put that in. Uh, the expense overall is reduced. Uh, last year we increased the expense budget because we had to outfit four new firefighters with protect clothing and uh, and other things. So uh, we have that in this budget this year. So I don't need that next year. So I've taken those uh, costs out. I have increased. Uh, one line item, whoops, and that was, uh, that's for costs. Uh, we've we've um, moved beyond how we kept our records for, for staffing and uh, callback and, um, and for um, pre-fire planning and went to computerized uh, systems for that. That has a cost uh, to it, but it's really increased our efficiency. And um, I want to build that into the budget because I didn't have a place for it. And uh, I also want to look at a, a fire reporting system uh, that was going to help us get better data out. So um, I, I've asked for an increase uh, for those for those programs. Yeah. Uh, regarding your overtime budget, yes. uh, have we realized uh, an ability to decrease that given the additional hires? We haven't hired them yet. Do you anticipate? Uh, I do anticipate, yes. This yeah. year, I, I hate to say it, but this year is it's trending very well. I, I looked at it um, this year compared to this time last year, and we're 50% lower this year at this time than last year. I hope the trend continues, but I can't hear it. But once we get the other firefighters on board, yes, we, we should see uh, uh, savings. The, the fire alarm hours and that, that $15,000 budget, that's just for outdoor boxes, is that right, not indoor? That's good. We, we maintain from basically the box you see on the building uh, back back to the uh, back to the uh, police, fire station, police station. So the, the fire alarm system consists of a uh, circus to go to Wakefield, goes mm -hmm. to North Reading uh, for our mutual aid circuits. And then um, we have um, uh, boxes on, on buildings, our school buildings, municipal buildings, and then on um, larger uh, buildings in town, churches, um, and also uh, larger residential buildings. The, build, the building code, if you were to build a building now, the building code doesn't require, uh, I can't require a master box to be put on a building to get an automatic response. I asked for it on, on certain occasions. If it's a large building, a lot of residents live there, there's like a life safety hazard. Because uh, a, um, we call a central station, a alarm company has 90 seconds to turn around an alarm. So we have some buildings in town that are large wood frame buildings that aren't sprinkled. If we waited 90 seconds for that um, company to turn it around, we can, we can be on the fire trucks driving down the street in 90 seconds. So we give up a lot of time for that. So I like to, to have that. It's not an absolute perfect system because um, it can get taken down by, by tree branches and things like that. But our fire alarm crew puts a lot of time and effort into um, maintaining it. And, um, and for our, some of our school buildings, that's the only uh, notification that we would receive. There isn't a um, fire alarm monitoring company for those. So to follow up on it, two things. One is fifteen thousand dollars enough to be able to do that. It's and been it's been increased to twenty. It's up to twenty. Okay. So I think we're in a good spot with that. Okay. And then the second question is, with all the new construction that's going on, that are all probably what you consider to be large, yeah. are all of them going to have the master system? We do ask. We do ask for for that. How do we know? Do we have to wait till it's done to know that it's there? No, we ask right up front. Yeah. We generally during the the uh, development review team meeting. It's not a significant cost for them. It's, it's, it's about a $2,000 cost for them. So in the scheme of things, well, I haven't had a problem yet. But in the scheme of things, it's not good. Um, Chief, in the past, um, you sort of broke down some of the billings that we got because we do do transport. Yes. Um, is that trend going up? Is, can you talk a little bit about that? And, and then also, too, if we're doing, uh, first of all, I know that you implemented 
a better billing system, so we're actually getting what we're supposed to get, which is great. Um, but also, too, does that sort of extra stuff put more wear and tear on the, you know, on the um, on the apparatus? And then, you know, is there a cost that should be sort of figured into that? And, um, well, generally we just we bill for when we transport a patient, so we can't like add extra on for the fire truck that came out. Um, so. Uh, fiscal year, last fis fiscal year 18, um, we brought in $766,000. The year prior to that was seven ninety, dollars and the year prior to that was eight forty four. dollars So it, 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 it kind of ebbs and flows. I can, I, you can have this if you'd like. No, fine. So, um, you can so, send it the packet. Okay. So it, it, it can ebbs and flows. It, it depends on, one of the things, it depends on the patients you're transporting. Um, and, and the level of service that you're providing. So an ALS patient is, is a more expensive patient for us to treat. Uh, an ALS2 patient with, with your very sick patients, they require several doses of medication. Those, those types of calls can generally be you know, $22, $23, dollars $2400 because of the services that they need. So we bill by the service. So it goes up and down because you don't know who your patient's going to be and what their insurance is. If the, a Medicare patient, we might receive $600 for that patient, and if they have Blue Cross Blue Shield, we might receive $2,300. The other trend that we're seeing is because of the high cost of health care, um, people have very high deductibles. Yeah. And so it's not covering the, the ambulance bill that it used to. So, um, so that, that's been a, been a factor. You know, every once in a while I get a phone call about it, you know, why is it so high? And, and um, you know, I have to walk them through, you know, how, how really expensive it is to provide an, an EMS system for the community. So when we budget, maybe this is a question for Bob, I'm not sure. So when we put the budget together, do you sort of put a placeholder right about, okay, we're going to expect six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars of buildings that sort of go into the budget, or is it just sort of we get what we get and it, we're happy to get it. Or Sharon builds this into the what, what the town's going to receive through revenue. So she takes. Speak for, for Sharon. Yeah, yeah. Sharon yeah we, we, we kind of look at what the stores. Okay. So there is a line item for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, police, fire, dispatch, or custom. Good evening. I brought some my hands. It's possible for that. Thank you. Yes. 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 Sagala and they brought Erica McNamara, the director of our CASA, here to explain the yeah, CASA budget when we get to that section. Okay. All right, first thing on the police department's FY20 budget is 3.4% for FY19. Approximately 95% of this budget is spent on personnel. Here's our organization chart uh, up to date. Um, that includes the new admin system in the second column, the joint between the police and fire department. Um, it helps us with less to carry applicants, public record requests, and it's helping as a backup for all fire departments, administrative services. The breakdown: We have 46 full-time officers. We are fully staffed. We have two currently in the academy now, but we were able to f hire the five additional officers. Uh, the, the two in the academy should graduate in February of this coming year. So then we'll be completely up to up to staff. And then, yeah, the school resource officer did start this last July, so we do have the second additional school resource officer school as well. Wages um, that get 3.3 percent higher than last year. Um, so again, it's for the 46 officers, three administrative assistants, 
being a part time parking lot officer, officer and a director of officer. 19 for the arresting guards, two full time positions for our counselor, which we'll get to. Uh, and the salary line meets all contractual and direction on the guide non union compensation to date, uh, including debts and coal adjustments. Chief, uh, same question on overtime. Uh, How's the management of overtime coming with the additional staff? Yeah, absolutely. Right now, we're still we're, we're actually under where we were this last year. Um, our overtime, we're actually for some reason we usually do really well at managing it. I don't think we normally don't. I don't think it's been a year, but a while that we've actually gone over on overtime in the police department. Our expenses are around three point four percent. We actually uh, asked the town man for an additional police car because honestly, with all the additional officers now we. Uh, being Fred Flintstone using the cows of your feet, we need <laughs> actually need to <laughs> So, you know, I've asked them for that additional car uh, right. stuff in the bottom one. And that, that's also related somewhat to the ability of um, DPW to work on the Correct. automobiles and how quickly they can turn them around. Absolutely, yeah. So, it's all related, yeah. So, we have at least 10 cars that are going pretty much 24-7, uh, and we do rotate them. However, they, they get a lot of, of hours used on them, get a lot of miles to put on yeah, them. And they do miles too. Correct, right, yeah. a lot of start and stop it. Uh, it's just a general overview of the patrol division. Um, like I said, I give it to, to read as well. But we have, uh, the day shift has 11 officers. Um, it's one, the day shift lieutenant, two sides, and eight patrol officers. Knights are currently staffed with 21 officers, including a lieutenant, five sergeants and 15 patrol officers. Uh, patrol is responsible for all your initial calls, uh, for any, anything you can imagine. They're the first responders that you get your house, you know, any car accident, any, any initial reports is what patrol takes. What are the day and night hours for the two? So days are seven to five. Okay. Um, they're four on four office, the schedule they have. In nights, eight to eight, and four to midnight. Oh, so it's two shifts at night. They overlap an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, which gives it time for roll call training. Yeah. Uh, again, that's uh, some more of the patrol, what they do, their functions. Uh, unwanted quests? Yeah. It's guests. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to ask you what that was. Um, all right, here, here we go to our stats from the beginning. Officers have gone up a little bit. We, uh, these are yeah, This is as of uh, Monday morning. We ran them for the set for, for uh, January. For, I'm sorry for 2018. That's where we're at so far. Calls for service, all call service, and uh, motor vehicle citation from one given out so far today. Uh, incident reports filed. We're trending pretty consistently with last year. Again, we're, we're about 110 behind last year so far. We still have almost a full month to go. Chief, are, are these um, going back to the police statistics? Mm -hmm. uh, are these is this increase aligned with our population growth? That's are a good question. I, I, you know, I'm, that would be I could do some research to find it, but I'm not sure if it's in line with the population or if it's just. That's a good question. You know, I I would assume it has to do, with, but honestly, it may have to do with. People are calling us for different things now that they weren't calling before. As you'll see, we have some more, as we, some of the slides come up, there's definitely more calls for uh, mental health related calls than we probably had in a long time. You know, yeah. 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 correct. The so. real point, Chief, is that it's good we hired the five officers that we did. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. In, in the previous slide, shows in a continuing increase each year. Absolutely correct. Thank you. All right, arrests, uh, again, we're actually, if we trend, we'll actually be higher than last year with arrests. Uh, complaint apps, complaint apps are when we summons people to court instead of actually arresting them. Um, it's similar, but a lot of crimes we actually can do with, with the, a lower uh, priority. We could actually summons people instead of actually arresting them, physical, physical arrest. So the constables serve those? No, those are things we actually, uh, that we, we put into the court, the court actually sends paperwork to you all. Okay. Uh, protective custody, alcohol, drug, uh, uh, alcohol and drugs, uh, motor vehicle crash investigated, and fraud ID, credit card, all other, all other uh, fraud related incidents. And the blue is, is not full. Correct, full that's year. December 2nd of yeah. this year. Okay, alarm calls. Alarms about 
down a little bit from, uh, which is good actually. I think, honestly, a lot of companies have actually tightened up on how uh, your, their services are, yeah, which has helped us to have a, a lot of the alarm calls we get are false alarms. So it's like they actually, the company, they're actually doing their diligence to help on that. Okay. Uh, overdoses are actually down this year um, so far. Suicide attempts, you can see that. Uh, substance involving alcohol, substance of drugs, substance involving opioids. In mental health, we just started collecting this last year, so this is where we're at for mental health calls. So, right now, drugs, substance, drug related, are higher than alcohol. Correct this year. Correct this year, yeah. This is probably good for Erica. I mean, can you, can you measure? You know, the S of our CASA and bringing some of these numbers on. I mean, I know it's hard to kind of correlate it. Would you be doing a lot of great work and the numbers are down? And is it, is it tough to make that leap? We do have a rate of overdoses compared to communities that do not mention coalitions. So there is a track, some of that. Um, but you will see um, what we've seen that is a, a challenge for police and for fire is the co occurring um, mental health flash substance use. So things are getting more. Good. Um, you might see slightly fewer. The cases are very complex, and you see repeat people. So the, the disease of addiction, the disorders are very challenging. Um, but our, our office do a fabulous job of working with our crisis services in the region and getting folks the psychiatric services they need. This maybe a question for Bob, but um, the suicide attempts or threats and the mental health that we call, is there something, there you are, um, is there something the Board of Health can be doing in this area? I realize that's a very yeah, big like question. That's, that's the length that no one's ever made, so. yeah. I say something yeah. on that? Yeah. So we run a mental health first aid program for the community. So one of our goals in looking at data five years ago, maybe six now, John, um, yeah. was um, we started, we we're starting to see an increase in the number of suicide attempts. Um, we were also seeing an increase in, in folks feeling um, some discomfort around how to talk about the issue. And so we've increased training, um, which has also increased the number of reports which is good because people are calling. And what we've also seen is a trend where um, people used to notify other folks by leaving a note if they were at that, that level of risk. Now we're seeing people text, and those texts are really helpful and they're really easier for them to follow up on because they can also help use that text to get some more services they need a little bit faster. So we have seen, it might, it, it, it is higher, but we're also seeing the increase in reporting is also kind of corresponding with the training, and the training has been done at the school level and throughout the community um, as well. Thank you. Yeah, so just to give you a, an idea, 700 people have been trained uh, just okay. in the last few years um, as people who can assess for suicide. Context matters. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And the Board of Health question is a tough one because um, they have a broad range of of uh, powers, but the Board of Health regulations don't typically focus on this type of thing, so um, I'm not sure, you know, certainly explore it with the Board of Health if you like, but. Yeah, the statutes don't seem to empower them in the area of mental health. But it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of statutes on for the boards of health, um, and I've looked at them, looked at them all when I was on the board of health, um, and really none of them tied into this. Mm -hmm. This is kind of maybe could be, could be fixed, but we have seen um, in surrounding communities, health can help sponsor training and awareness, and mm -hmm. that's something that you know um, I'm happy to, to work with, with Laura yeah. on, and um, she knows us as a resource. We just collaborated on making sure she was connected to our domestic violence resource at the police department, yeah. and um, working on um, doing some meetings for them this year on substance use as well as mental health. So. And we also interface for us. Yes, and so we also sponsor the Interface Referral Service, which is a free, a, a free service because of the, the funding that we receive. And anyone in Reading can call and yeah. get with an outpatient mental health provider. Because what we're finding as well as an increase in the more serious psychiatric or suicide attempt issues, mm -hmm. there's a higher number of people who require outpatient mental health. Um, and we've seen, I think the last number we checked just last month, we had 170 um, Reading residents get matched with a mental health services well, provider. That was yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah. That's great. And that goes a long way with keeping people well. Um, yeah. 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 And yeah. getting the right diagnosis, the right assessment, all of that good stuff. Right, right. 
case. Yeah, I, I, yeah. On, again, on the board of health issue, they they, they can if they feel something is uh, a public health threat, doesn't matter what it is. Do something about it, but it's a it's a regulation, and I'm not sure, again, mm -hmm. um, what Perhaps regulation not. can you make for this? Right. Perhaps not the board of health then, but our public health department. Yeah. I mean, we definitely collaborate, you know, across departments as well as with elder services and their social worker and the, the nurse liaison. Yeah. So there's a lot of collaboration that's happening. Um, but just in the last month, um, we've chatted about um, in the next six months doing more training for the Board of Health and offering that as, as a resource yeah. to them. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Domestic services are up this year, um, domestic assistance. Child custody exchanges, uh, those are done in our lobby of the police department. Um, but honestly, on a regular basis, it used to be a lot less, and it's, it's actually trending higher. And uh, 209A, which are domestic restraining order violations, are actually down this year. Is that a voluntary situation of the child, child custody? custody? Yeah, it, well, it's, it could be court ordered. It could be, uh, oh, okay. you know, yeah, yeah or, you know, through probate court. Yeah. All right, I want the guest calls. Um, threats, harassing phone calls, suspicious persons, and uh, suspicious motor vehicles. And that could be anything. People call, you know, they see a car they put with the lights off at 10 o'clock at night, you know. Um, 51 A's with their child they need a certain service uh, reports. <laughs> Violation of harassment orders with the number street. Welfare of person checks, uh, missing persons, yeah, missing persons, person juveniles. Welfare person check. Yeah. Just yeah, most of them it's elderly, but it could be it could be it could be it could be mental health related, quite honestly. It could be drug related, it could be alcohol related, yeah. you know, without a you know, it could be just someone just can't can't get in touch with someone for a, a day or less, you know, yeah. hang up on the service. And they'll call us to go check and they'll find the pot and we'll go down and uh, and see if we can find the person. A lot of times a lot of times you know, they're not there, they're away a lot, you know, but you never know. You know, yeah. kinda of run into the gamut of elderly years. There's also been an increase of um, calls that are linked in because of um, someone's welfare concern through a hotline or through Facebook. So just I think in the last month we had a Facebook, um, you know, worry around someone making statements that were suicidal. So the yeah. officers were able to kind of work with surrounding communities to try to figure out the situation. But we also have had, I think in the last nine months, at least six calls either through the suicide prevention hotline or the text. Uh, crisis line, which is used a lot by teens and young adults, um, if they make a statement or the crisis counselor is feeling like they're at a higher risk, they will loop back to 911 and ask for a welfare check or some kind of connection. Um, so it, it's a little more complicated than the loop back, but they make the connection so that the person can get what they need. Right. And as I just wanted to, it, last year I believe you explained that, that, it, that it's, it's better for an officer to respond to these calls than, say, a social worker because the, the officer has more authority to... At a welfare check, you mean? Yeah, or yeah. Just generally. I think in, that was in, in relation to the school resource yeah, officer. Yeah, school resource yeah. officer. Absolutely, yeah. Because um, yeah. the officer can also, uh, we can actually uh, consider the pink slip, which is basically we could, if, if someone has a mental health issue and they threaten to hurt themselves or harm themselves, mm -hmm. we can actually take them to a, to a hospital, whereas a social worker you know, wouldn't have that type of power, right. you know, you know yeah. yeah, that's, that is something that we do use sometimes, you know, we don't, you know, we, yeah, it's, it's one of our tools, you know. Yeah, that's for like a time certain, several days you can hold them there? Yeah, um, actually, we bring them hospital just to be evaluated in the hospital yeah. decides, the doctor in the hospital decides what, what to do, but we could at least get them to a, to a, uh, Hospital. And can you do that for adults as well? Yep, that's for yeah. anyone. Yep. Okay, this is just uh, a little bit about how we report crimes to the, to the state and federal government. We use NIVAS, which is the National Incident Based Reporting System. Um, UCR we do as well, but that's more of summary based crimes, whereas NIVAS is incident based, which is more specific about, about the actual crimes that are our, it's our supervisors have to, after every Report it comes up on the computer that actually have to be filed through NIVAS. They have to answer all these questions that the supervisor goes into the computer system and has to answer a series of questions about about the call, about the gender, about race, a, a bunch of things, different things that, that years ago UCI never did, which was just more of the actual crime, of, say homicide, or sexual assault, whatever it was. It's just a number. But now we actually report different 
direct element to the public branch of the federal government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chief, do you track in any way uh, cyber crimes or crimes with the intention of defrauding elderly uh, by the phone, by internet? I didn't see any categories. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it would be under the fraud. That's oh, kind of general. Okay. Yeah, we, you know, we could probably get more specific. I don't know, talk to detectives, but yeah, absolutely, yeah, that's a that's a big thing to be honest with you with um, you know with scams and stuff, and that's why we do put a lot of things on Facebook and Twitter once we yep. see a certain scam. So those calls come in on your caller ID, and it says you know nine four two, so you think you're being called by somebody in town, and it's yeah. they've looped in, and, and then, right? Then, yeah. Then, yeah. It's a yeah. call. You can put any number you want. Yeah, <laughs> and they they find your um, three digit. Your, your first four digits of your phone pretty quickly. Absolutely, right. Yeah. All right, these are some of the UCI crimes that I reported um, to the government. Let's see. Where are we at today? There's a part two. Yep, there's your fraud. No weapons violations this year, it's great. <laughs> Sorry, I know I was just wondering if, they, if you tie, if you can tie the increase in domestic violence incidents and any other trends, is it related to substance use? Is it really any kind of greater trend across the Commonwealth or nation? Well, I think the majority are related to substance abuse of some sort, you know, whether it's alcohol or drugs. You know, I, I, I would say without having specific numbers, over 90% of the calls we go to involving domestic violence involves some type of substance, you know. Um, is, that, is that more so than in previous years, or is that? No, it's, it's that, generally, it's, like it's general. Percent. Yeah, and it also it ups around the holidays, to be honest with you, or in the summertime. You see the summer or holidays seem to be our, our, our biggest time of year for uh, the two times a year when we see the more, more domestic violence calls, you know. So, I mean, nothing specific to what's happening this year, either locally or no, 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 it just seems to be, you know, I mean, you know, if, if, if the economy was down, we could see obviously more issues, but you know, no, it's just usually when we go to calls, a um, majority of the time involves some type of substance at all. The detective division, a staff of eight officers, a lieutenant detective, five detectives, two school resource officers, and two civilians comprised of everybody calls to get substance abuse. Um, basically, the detectives follow up on all investigations. Any any call that comes in that, re that requires that any type of follow up more than what can be done right immediately is done by the detective division. Um, as you can see, sexual assaults, homicides, obviously child enticement, missing persons, fraud, cyber crimes, um, and also our detectives are one of our detectives, the prosecutor at uh, district court, goes over and actually prosecutes the law. Um, crimes and it handles all the court paperwork and the arrest and the summonses and it just make sure everything is in order for the court to proceed every day. Uh, every Woman District Court has six departments that, re that go to Woman and um, the six prosecutors even has required to have an officer that actually is a prosecutor. Uh, Ch Chief, there's a question from a school committee member. Um, actually, with this stuff officer resident. I'm Actually, you don't, you don't have a quorum. Sorry? Right, you don't have a quorum. Right, so, so I'm just you, asking. You are indeed, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you are, I couldn't read all the labels on the crimes, and I was wondering if graffiti was in there, and if you're able to keep track of the graffiti incidents slash hate incidents, and whether that will be tracked over time. Absolutely, yeah. But they're right, I think they're on the vandalisms right now, but... That doesn't mean it doesn't get the attention of detectives, right? This Absolutely no. Are no, these categories? These are these are UCI categories, okay? But yes, the, um, we're not going back all the way. I think we put them on the vandalism right here because if we had, because quite honestly, they consider vandalism if they were if they were hate crimes, we would have they would be ordered as a, you know to federal government as a hate crime. Yeah. But right now they're considered vandalism, so we do. But we do have them tracked separately in our department for the specific incidents you're referring to. Okay, absolutely, yeah. And we will continue to. All right, detectives continue. Um, a lot of responsibility to have a control officer. We have uh, one detective assigned tonight who specifically does a lot to do with narcotic investigations. We also have a detective assigned to the FBI joint uh, 
uh, Ocean Def Task Force, which is a, basically a, a conglomerate of a lot of departments around the Boston area who uh, who work major narcotics investigations around this part of the state. Some ties to Reading, some not, but you know it's it's, it's mutual aid to the uh, FBI. And again, the S, the both the SROs, the second SRO is fully in place. Uh, he was trained over the summer, and quite honestly, because of a lot of the uh, graffiti incidents, he's been very active in the last um, four months. He's been in, assigned to his position. You uh, know, our cost, we still have the, the prescription roundup. I don't know how many pills are at this point. Thirty thousand. Wow. Forty thousand bottles of pills collected. Wow. <coughs> And the detective unit is that's where they're at this year. So open our active investigations. We've had so far this year 148. Support services. Uh, support services is, uh, is staffed by four offices the support services lieutenant, the traffic and safety officer, the armor, fleet maintenance officer, and the community service officer. Um, they had three, had three civilians. One function as a police and fire administrative assistant, which is a new position. The second, who is the domestic violence advocate, which is grant funded, uh, which is a new position. And the third Great. is the park enforcement and traffic control officer, it's one person, it's what job. Yeah. Um, the support services overseas, you have training accreditation, um, all our social media, all our fleet maintenance, and all of our, um, and actually I'll get to the next page, but all of our, our community relations, you know, coffee with a co-op, all that stuff we do on the side. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the maintenance officer reminded me of the, the point you made earlier. You're going to purchase an, another cruiser in FY20? Correct. Well, um, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I haven't paid close enough attention to the your current fleet. All the vehicles from the same manufacturer? No, we have Fords and Chevys. And that's what the town actually can can actually service down the town uh, yacht support and Chevys. Do you have any any agreements negotiated with the manufacturer? I know these are not large fleets for them, but are they we go through by the state bidding process. Okay. So yeah, we do. We you mean for pricing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we actually we we actually go through the state process, and if we don't think the price is, if we can get a better price, we'll do quotes and actual go through the actual uh, uh, go through the, getting three quotes and doing it that way as well. Okay. Traffic and safety officer, you know, with our traffic and safety officer is, is responsible for all issues of concern and construction as well for um, any public safety on the roads, any public safety for sidewalks. We're involved with all the DRT uh, meetings and all the uh, PTTTF, the Parking Traffic Transportation Task Force meetings, which are held monthly. Uh, the community service officer, her job has expanded. She's the uh, elder human, human uh, service liaison with the uh, elder services department she's also a, a domestic violence officer who works with the new advocate uh side by side in contact with the domestic violence incident person we've, we've had to see what services we can provide them with um and she also handles all the uh i say the, the things that we community stuff that we really like to do for the public the, the coffee with the cops the mm -hmm. the open houses the uh, the um uh Citizen Police Academy, the RAD program, with the Rape Aggression Defense Program that we do, try to do twice a year. She really is, those Shaughnessy, she really does a great job to handle everything, you know, from soup to nuts for, for all the uh, the good stuff we try to provide the town as well. Well, you do other, all the other stuff is good too. It's no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the positive stuff, people are just happy. Yeah. Um, parking officer, that's, uh, you know, the tendencies out this year, patients. We're down a little bit over the last couple of years um, in citations for a party. Chief, that can't be because everybody's obeying the law. <laughs> are, are we trying to be I a think more this year, uh, I can user tell you, friendly? I started this year doing the winter citations later. We actually started a oh, Four weeks later than we normally do, getting for the overnight pocket for the winter. So I think that's part of it in the last month because right. this is up to day two. Uh, we just decided to start right after Thanksgiving. Instead of what we were doing, starting two or three weeks before Thanksgiving, then stopping for Thanksgiving weekend. So we decided, unless it snowed, which it did actually a couple days before, so we had good stuff for one night. But in general, we thought it was better just to start right after Thanksgiving weekend, you know, with enforcement for the, for the, for the winter. Where is the bulk of this coming from? That's where, the, the down, yeah, absolutely, the whole parking downtown area. Mm -hmm. 
and also the fines are different you can see but also a lot of it what is this includes the fees so a lot of people if you don't pay a citation within 20 days or it accused fees and this also includes the fees that have accrued the people's uh yeah parking tickets as well yeah that was the police budget. Now I want to dispatch. Oh, uh, Mr. Chair, there's a question. On here. Uh, yeah. Question. Um, <clears throat> I love those um, debit card like parking meter things. Mm -hmm. What would it cost for a town of this size to do something like that? And it, it might make your lives easier as well. That's been up for, I think, there's actually, we have a, a, an ongoing discussion about it right now. I don't have anything specific myself personally, but I know that that's been up to talk. Um, we actually have our offices, of, one of our offices on a, a committee right now that they're talking about. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, as part of the updated parking study that we finished this summer, um, we looked at that and we looked at um, how we could use some of the later technology to do some of the work that we do in town. So that's that's on our wish list and our hit list going forward uh, from the parking study. And we work very closely with Mark and his team, um, at least monthly, sometimes more. I don't know if we're too small to be able to do that or what the economics are at this point to just have it automated. Well, if you're asking, right now there's no page parking in downtown. And we don't have enough activity to justify going to paid parking. We asked that same question, should we be looking at paid parking? Yeah. Um, any of the times we've sat down with the business community, they've given us a very large, loud no. Of Please course don't they do. do. That. Right. Of course they do. Please don't do that. Right. Um, even though in some ways it could be argued that it would help mm -hmm. because we would have a system in place to, to regulate parking. Mm -hmm. um, we, we just simply do not have the volume that would justify paid parking at this point. But it's on our radar screen and we're right. gonna keep Keep an eye on because that could change. There's no other questions. I'll move on to the dispatch budget. Okay, the uh, dispatch is a three and a half percent increase compared to FY19. Again, over 95 percent of this budget is spent on personnel. Um, it's 11 full time employees, 10 dispatchers, and one communication supervisor. Um, they handle every call that comes into the station. Um, basically, unless you're directly calling a, a, one of our direct phones, any call that comes into the 944-1212-911 and is handled by our telecommunicators. Um, all right, this was good for me. So we're actually, one of our, I think I know that's up, that's being discussed is also a new dispatch center because our, our equipment is, is, you know, it's getting up in, in age. However, uh, I know that's under, Still discussion with uh, with plans going forward with um, the uh, the whole staff, the the whole building security uh, right. implementation as well. Could I just make a brief remark? Uh, when you call one two one two, you get voicemail at NIVR, and you might want to look at some of the ordering of the choices there because some of the ones you're most likely to call about are at the bottom of the stack. Okay. So maybe think about. It. Okay, okay, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. We actually put that in the place. That's yeah. So I think I was a little bit hesitant to do that, except that I think the yeah. dispatch is really... It makes sense. It, it helped us with them for getting it's the, every single call that had to be answered right away. It kind of can direct people into different positions. It's because especially since they are doing some more things than just answering the phone, right. stickers and everything else that they do. And um, they asked for it, and I went to the town and that. We, were, we figured we'd at least try and see how it went for a while. You know, yeah, the most important you might probably higher up than they are. Okay, all right, thank so you. Look at it. Absolutely, yeah. thank you. Chief, uh, just saying, I wanted to ask Bob a question about, could you just remind us about the state of the dispenser and their, and their options, or maybe lack thereof? It's probably best to do that Tuesday as it's scheduled as a little discussion on council. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, thank you. Right. Record request um, around this year. We've had. This is just the ones for the police? For the, just for the police department, correct. So we're up to 40, 443 so far this year. And some can take two minutes and some could take several hours a day to get all the information for what we need. So that's why we have the additional staff to help us with that is outstanding. It really is a help. Um, all right, and here's. Uh, has changed in the last year. Um, we've gone from 41 to 46 officers. Five new officers uh, dedicated to one school resource officer. Um, 17,000 in equipment and uh, 30,000 clothing were, were allotted last year. 
Um, so she had administrative position, which is also has already been in place. Uh, and again, two offices, they're all high, except for the two that are in the account. should be out in February. Um, and we have no opposition to that now. Thank you. Oh, oh great. Oh, yeah. So I remember when you came in here last, you know, last time when we were really, when, when the order was on the table, and one of the things that I just, that struck you, struck me when you, when you talked about it last year was that, you know, you were very, you, you wanted to assure the community that, you know, we have enough officers and you guys are doing the job. And, and the main, sort of the main, the main, one of the main reasons for asking for the additional staff was that you were going to be able to do things that you couldn't do. That you were, but in the past you were just going, you were going from call to call to call, and there was no time to kind of think about, you know, what you just, you were just responding, you weren't being proactive. Now that you have the officers and they're all, well, mostly all in place, yep, until, until correct. February, the rest of them will come. Could you just talk a little bit about the things now that you can do that sure. you couldn't do a year ago? So uh, we actually do a lot more walk and talks, as they're called, in the square area. Um, we have an officer now during the day and in the evenings as much as we can out of the car, walking in the square area, walking, you know, up until 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night as well. And one thing we do that we started recently was we do two selective enforcements, which are 30 to, uh, minutes to an hour each. Each officer does um, on on each on each shift. So when people call, we, we have a lot of issues with traffic and that people call about. So what we want to do is we, we'll send an officer for a week to two weeks in a specific area uh, during certain during specific times to, to, to watch and monitor the traffic and uh, give actual, you know, to write citations and, and actually have, we have it all um, registered and all, all uh, they have to come in and do a form on it. So we know specifically we can get back to the resident or to the board or to whoever asks for information with a specific, okay, I have, you know, someone says there's a lot of speedings on Franklin Street. So we could, you know, have officers sit up there for a couple weeks. They say, you know, around evening time, fine. So we'll have it between you know, five and seven or five and six, whatever the hours are. And we'll have officers sitting up there, which is something we really had a hard time doing in the past because we were kind of going from call to call to call. And um, we used to do it. We tried to do one before. Now we're up to two per officer. So that's a big difference than we had a year ago. Yeah. Which, you know. Are you using license plate cam cameras? We have one. You have one car we have with one. Yeah, it's, they're expensive, so we have one machine that does that, that's on a roaming car around town. So that's for enforcement? So you can, yeah, for uh, the expired plates, uh, unregistered motor vehicles, revoked licenses. Yeah, we do have one of those in town. I remember that being uh, a big advantage to adding new officers. Plus, um, they have a break from, uh, they have time to sort of decompensate, I think, if well, you press. call the call the call. The, right, you know, decompress a little bit. And also, quite honestly, they have tight. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. I, I didn't mean they, that. <laughs> <laughs> they have, to, even to get reports done, I mean, it gives you a little more time to put your time and effort into it yeah. instead of, you know, before it was happening a lot, you'd be at, you're doing your report and you had to, you know, run out of the station to go to a call, you yeah. know, and that's just, it just takes you out of that mind frame. We'd rather you get your report done and then go back to, yeah. to on the road, you know, instead of kind of separate a little bit compared to having to, you know, your 10 minutes into a report or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden you're out and then back and out and back, you know. Yeah. It just makes it more, you know, more palatable if it's all done at one time. Yeah. Do you know of any communities that are using uh, red light uh, cameras to catch infractions, uh, people running red light? Not that I'm aware of, at least in this location, around this part of town. I think Boston might be, but I think that's a city that I, but I don't, not one I know of in this area. Is that anything we're thinking about doing here? It hasn't come up. Um, no, it hasn't come up with any conversations I've been in. Not that we were not open to it, but it hasn't come up, you know. Um, you get a lot of rear end accidents because people slow the brakes. Get nervous, yeah. They get the take in the mail. Uh, and they're going to get caught today. Okay. Chief, I know it came up a couple of times, a couple of years ago about um, sort of the sort of ma mandated use of body cams, um, and I know that that's a really expensive capital outlay. Can you have, do you have an update on sort of where we are on that in terms of, is that something that's going to come down that we're going to have to do? Is it something that if you would like to do? Is it something that, um, you know, you see as having to come back here at some point? And, and I would think 
probably within my span of being police chief, I would say you probably have it happen. And right now, it's not mandated. There's only there's very few departments in this part of the country, including the state, that actually use them. Um, but the one is one. Um, but I think that might be the only one in this area who actually has implemented it fully. Um, other parts of the country, they're all, you know, California, but everyone has one. It just hasn't gotten, quite honestly, the hold here. And, and with the unions, I know it's going to be a negotiable thing that we're going to have to discuss and sit down with the town manager on. And, um, um, you know, I would like to see, I would like to probably eventually see maybe a pilot program, you know, go into place. But right now, we just, it just hasn't been on the top of the list, quite honestly, right, for the last year at least, you know. There are a bunch of um, state legal issues, too. Like, around what do you do with the the data that's right. collected right. from a public record, if right. there are public records requests, there are privacy issues, there are issues with um, like two party, you have to have, for recordings, you have to have two party consent exactly. in Massachusetts. So there are a bunch of state legislative fixes that probably have to happen. Right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. There so I'm just going to, my name is Erica McNamara, the director of the Reading Coalition. Welcome back. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, where we are with funding, just to give you an update. Um, we have been um, in place since 2006. We've not done a number of programs. I'm not going to get into the programs and projects we do because we have brief time, but there's oodles of information on our website, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions. But just to give you an update, we are in um, year nine of a 10-year federal grant that will end, um, I'm sorry, it should be 930-19. I was getting worried. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's 19, thank you. Um, and in our grant, that basically um, funds a full-time director, a half-time outreach coordinator, as well as our um, expenses and program support. One of our big programs is paying for the interface referral service. We pay that partially through the grant, and then we've received funding from um, the hospital trust fund in the past, as well as from um, private donors, which has been very helpful. We also fund the police text-to-tip program, which is a two-year subscription fee that allows folks to send an anonymous text, text or submit them by web, um, and that has been very helpful for investigations. And partly why our CASA was part of bringing that program is that um, people do tend to like um, share drug and substance use tips um, through the text to tip um, so it is very useful in terms of um, narcotics investigations. Um, we received an earmark this year that was um, advocated for by Representative um, James Dwyer who's retiring awesome. and um, he really, um, it was unsolicited. He felt like the quality of our work dictated um, putting that in the budget so we're very thankful for that. That is just for this year. Um, we also benefit from a regional grant. We partner with Medford Malden, Melrose, Wakefield, Winchester, and we have a, a, a state grant that is um, awarded to Medford, and then Medford provides a number of um, trainings and services and collaboration for us around the opiate issue specifically. So we meet on a weekly basis and exchange a lot of resources. We don't get direct funding, but the, the amount that we get from it is invaluable, um, and we have one of the strongest regional collaborations in the state. We are just at our statewide conference and got acknowledged for that. Um, we will continue to pursue grant uh, opportunities, but we will be ending the um, opportunity to, to get any more funding out of the current funder we have. So we are at year 10 and can no longer request any other funding. The goal for the drug-free community's 10-year program is for your program to um, be picked up in your location or your town and be sustainable. Um, so we've been working towards that for the last 10 years. Um, the request that um, the town manager has, has placed in as a placeholder is a request for 150000 which funds the full-time director position. It brings our outreach coordinator position back to full-time. It was a full-time position that was reduced in 2016 due to a reduction in grant funding. Um, it is very helpful to have um, the full-time outreach coordinator to do um, the amount of work that we have, as well as to reach a broader number of young people and provide support services. Uh, question, your your current grant of 125000 that's an annual amount? That's an annual amount, yeah. But that goes through 930-19, which is three months into yep. FY20? Mm -hmm. Yet your request here is 150 for FY20, so you're only really needing nine months. Yep. So why is it such a big number? If, if Bob can explain. Uh, discussions with the income in the past have been put in the full cost of something that needs to be in a new baseline and sustainable. Oh, I see. If we didn't put in 150 in the first year, we would be putting in three quarters in the first year and one quarter in the second year. 
Uh, so, so you the, may not the effect need of generally would be the, the one quarter extra in the first year simply goes back to free cash. Okay. The core craft is used in a one time thing. That's the antenna of the, we're going to manage the money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we work very well within our, our spending and we know what our expected uh, grant reimbursement will uh, our grant drawdown will be for those three months. So we share it as on top of all of that great stuff. Um, just a few highlights. Do you mind just yeah. moving to the next one? So, Not that far. There we go. Um, so just a few highlights. Um, since we've um, been working in the community, we've had a 12% reduction in underage drinking. Um, reducing underage drinking has one of been, been one of our biggest priorities because the research shows that if you can reduce underage drinking, other substance use will fall in terms of young people. Um, so that's been a huge priority for us. Um, we have been partnering with the police department on the RX Roundup program. We've had 4,000 RX pill bottles turned in by residents, which is an amazing partnership with the community. That also means that those pills are not going in our water supply, and they're also not being diverted by teens that could misuse them. Um, we have had a number of programs that we've developed to become model programs. So we started one of the first pre-arraignment diversion programs with our police officers, uh, partnered with our schools to develop a chemical health education program. Those programs are now replicated in four surrounding communities. Um, we have a number of other programs. Um, we were recently acknowledged um, by the national evaluators for the, the federal funding that we're part of, which is 1,700 coalitions, um, and we were chosen as a model because of our partnership with police. We're one of the few coalitions that's embedded at a police department, right. and the partnership that we have is, um, from what they've given us feedback on, is really unprecedented and something to be really proud of. Um, we also received a National Recovery Month Award this year. Uh, we were one of three coalitions in the country recognized for our work on um, Reading Unites for Recovery, which was held last September. Um, and I was recently honored by the Reading Rotary Organization, and D Deputy Chief asked me to keep it in there. I'm, I don't feel like acknowledging it, but the, partly why he wanted me to, to share a little bit about it is um, there were 22 other local rotaries that were nominating a person, but we were the only substance abuse prevention program acknowledged. So I felt that that was important, that we're a leader in the area. So that's a little bit about our CASA. Thanks for including Thank it. It's, it's, it's relevant. So, um, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's you know a testament to the work that's been done by you and the rest of the board and the town th that you know over a 10-year period and, and now we're basically um, absorbing this as, as as part of town government right as, as we should as you know be part of the um, um, accommodated cost so um, which I think is great probably takes a lot of pressure off on, on some things but also um, I guess the question I want to ask is what's next um, you know now that you, you know that we're going to be supported in town you know, by town government are there things that you would like to see our CASA do that obviously may not be able to be supported by town government but you know you're still gonna you're still gonna go for grants on, on you know um, targeted kinds mm -hmm. of things um, so the what's next so we're, we're always looking at what are the needs in the community that really drives what, what's next. So we're right now at the beginning of our next strategic planning process for the next five years. So the board is part of that. My job is to collect and, and disseminate the data and allow folks to get a sense of what's happening, see what the trends are. What we're seeing the most is the co-occurring mental health challenges. So I believe that a lot of our prevention work will also involve mental health promotion. Um, we also are seeing a need for um, niche services, um, such as um, one of the projects that I'll be writing a grant on this week is um, to maybe bring in a part-time recovery coach in partnership with Elliott Services that would be funded by a Win Winchester Hospital grant. So things that maybe don't into other categories, um, we're able to kind of see what's coming next. One of the partnerships we've been working on with police on is increasing the number of crisis intervention trained officers. So we also do a lot of work behind the scenes on looking at what training they need, how to help and support them, particularly around substance abuse and mental health. We'll continue to grow our mental health first aid program. Um, we've uh, trained uh, 700 people as first aiders. We have to train all new staff that come in um, to our Reading Public Schools. Um, our, all of our public library staff, I don't know where Amy is, um, is, is part of that training process. All town staff are welcome to attend it. So there's, I believe we will see a lot of work in the training area, um, education, promotion, prevention, um, but really we'll be looking at what does our data tell us are the, the big priorities in the area, and also going out to the community to ask for their input. That's always part of our process. Yeah. 
Yes. We also have to be mindful that we are under the federal grant through next October 1st. We have to follow their rules. So a lot of what um, is being discussed is forward looking. We have another 10 months to figure it out. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And just to, just to uh, finish out, just want to mention part of the work we've done in locating funding and accessing it, we brought in $1.6 million in grants um, through our CASA. And that has been matched by the town in terms of the support they've provided um, in matching our benefits, as well as some of the, the, the basic but very important services, the, the role that Sharon plays in, in helping us draw down the grant and, and do the grant reporting. And there's so many other pieces. But the value um, that we get from that $1.6 over the last 10 years has been immense in terms of the work that we've been able to do. So we hope that um, you know, we will all keep, always keep our eyes open for more funding opportunities. We're not afraid to write for it. <laughs> so. Absolutely. It, it, it reminds me a little bit of the library's return on, on investment. Uh, yeah, I mean, the town's gonna, it's chosen, or it looks like it's going to choose to uh, continue to fund our cost, which I think is a great idea, and that the return on investment will be, will be uh, very high. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I see the, the stat there, a 12% reduction on raised drinking in the past decade. You also mentioned another stat before the beginning of the presentation. Can you remind me what that was? It was a comparison, uh, a quantitative comparison to other towns that don't have a coalition. Oh, um, so overall, our rates for um, all substances for young people are lower because we have a prevention coalition. So we're measured against um, uh, other communities that have a prevention coalition versus not, and our rates tend to be between 5 and 7 percent lower in some areas and as high as 15 percent in other areas. Okay. So what the research in the the evaluation shows is that having the base board of directors that working that's always working on strategic planning across departments across the community as well as having the directed staffing um, plays a huge role in the collaboration and coordination around the issue of substance use and that lends itself to um, very powerful direct services work that the schools do but also the coordination around police training and other pieces allows us to have a broader impact than just what me or my outreach coordinator can do I find that any kind of quantification of the Similar to Andy's point yeah, uh, of, of the effectiveness of you guys, very helpful. Yeah, and that's probably why I wanted to share the, the role that the national evaluation felt like we played. So part of what we do as, as grant-funded programs is write these very lengthy reports that tend to be upwards of 100 pages every six months. Um, and I never know if anyone reads them. So when we got, when we got acknowledged um, by the national evaluator for this for our work with police, we were like, yay, someone's reading them. Uh, but we have, we have lots of um, more quantified data in terms of um, all of our different projects and programs and our outputs. So. Thank Thanks, you. Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you um, when's your next townwide event? You, you, you have, you, I know you've had some great events in the past. Yep. And uh, what's what's up next? So right now, we're working with the Reading Public Schools to um, bring a mental health series to the community in the spring. So we'll be working on um, bringing the documentary film Angst, which is focused on anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is a, a jumping off point to talk about some of the ways that um, substance use can be used as an um, Negative coping skills. Yeah, so um, that'll be one of the opportunities we'll have, as well as um, gatherings for folks to provide input on our future programming. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, um, I think I'll, uh, I'd like to take a quick, uh, give everyone a quick five-minute break, um, and and just Barry had reminded me. Um, if the department heads could, um, if we could get the presentations up on our website. Yeah, we said we'd do it as a signal. After. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay.
all the, with the gavel, the uh, select board back into session. Um, and now we're hearing from facilities. Good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Huggins. I'm the director of facilities for the town of Reading. And next to me is Kevin Cabuzzi, our assistant director. We'd like to uh, submit our FY20 requested budget. So we've listed up here our department mission, um, which is the same we obviously have submitted every year for the last three years since we've uh, created the core facilities budget for our core facilities department within the town of Reading. Uh, our staff main is, strives to maintain an efficient, safe, clean, attractive, and uh, inviting environment to support the mission for the town of Reading, and that's the public schools and the municipal buildings within the town of Reading. Along with that, we do long-term planning. It's not included in the mission, but long-term planning and capital, uh, capital Im implementation for the town. Our organization chart, um, it's uh, obviously director of facilities. We have a senior admin assistant, assistant director, who's responsible for the maintenance technicians, the town custodians, and the cleaning contract on the town side. We have a fish manager. It's important to note that that position is a school department position that manages the um, 18 school custodians uh, on the school side, as well as the cleaning contract that does the Red Memorial High School and the uh, Powellage Middle School. And we also have a rental coordinator uh, who's in charge of event, uh, event technicians and rental of space within the school buildings. So if you split it out, you look, we have core facilities with seven full-time employees, town facilities, which is a separate budget from the core, and then school facilities, which are school department employees, 19 full-time employees, a .5 courier, and a .5 rentals coordinator that make up our department. This just gives you a quick overview of buildings uh, that we take care of. There's 17 locations. There is eight schools and nine municipal buildings. The, on the town side, the two newest ones was the cemetery garage and the Matera cabin that were added two years ago to the uh, fleet. It's up there is also listed any uh, date of the most recent renovation for the schools and the town buildings. So one of the big things we do is run what's called the preventive maintenance program, and this is really where, where our department um, you know, we're mandated by, by state, uh, state law to do a lot of preventive maintenance, but there's some things that are not mandated that we do. And school buildings, as we've listed over here, um, we take care of all, all, all eight school buildings and nine school buildings. And on your next slide, you're going to see some of what we're doing. We're doing rooftop equipment two to three times per year. Exhaust fans are switched annually at all the buildings, boilers, fuel. Unit ventilators three times per year, elevator and lift service, that's a state mandated one. Emergency generators, we have that at several buildings. Grease traps, which are annual. Acid waste tanks, pest control, which is part of our integrated management policy, which we have 12 visits per year and we handle ongoing if we have issues, we handle it. Sprinkler and fire, which is an annual. Fire alarm three times per year. Fire extinguishers and fire suppression, which is the hoods over any of the surface hook food, and an exit signs and emergency lighting, which is annual. The way we pull it all off is through a use of technology heavily within the department. We have a preventive maintenance program, a work with a management program. We have an asset inventory maintenance um, module also. That, uh, as a matter of fact, the Permanent Building Committee uses that to uh, They're doing their assessment right now of all our facilities, and we've given them lots of information so to have current snapshots of all of our locations. Um, it can do reporting and break maintenance. So within those programs, there's a lot of different, um, the work order ma management helps us track work orders and assign work orders to in-house staff and outsourced staff. We also have um, a facilities rental that we can rent the buildings and we also have something that's called FS automation that we have spaces that are rented it ties the rental into an automation portion for the energy management which turns spaces on and off so that we're not wasting energy and just running things for seven or whatever the, the length of the uh, rental is. Uh, in addition to that another one of the modules we use is something called critical alarm automation which enables us to monitor um, breakdowns and low temperatures, 
uh, on different pieces of equipment and to get early warning so that we don't run into an issue with no heat in a building, um, a, a, a boiler that's broke down, for instance, something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is all, all geared towards just staying on top of everything and uh, being proactive in the way we operate the department. Mr. Chief. Yes, here. Um, on the technology, you saw we last year, maybe before that, we mm -hmm. talked about the technology, and it's really been a, a big win, mm -hmm. right, in terms of staying yep. on top of it. Are there any, any aspects of the technology that you just haven't tapped into yet, some modules you haven't put in? Is there, is there more, more runway in terms of efficiencies and savings from the, from the technology? Um, or are you there's, there's things we would like to probably you know roll out. We, they have the ability for us to do something called it's, a, it's barcoding for our equipment if we wanted to, um, which our guys that do carry smartphones could actually go up in the, as well as the outside technicians could actually walk up to a piece of equipment and scan it and it would give a complete history on everything that's been done at the piece of equipment. That's something we would like to do eventually. Um, we have the ability to do that. It's just that we need to tie in our outside contractors and our guys. That are generally speaking. And our guys do not carry phones, our maintenance technicians. But that would be a great thing to have. Right now, you'd have to come back to the office. Everybody yeah. that comes in to work when they work in a Reading school building or a Reading town building comes in and they receive a, a work order from Kevin and it gives a list of where they're going, what piece of equipment it is, and when they come back, because we're logging their time, we're able to match that up with an invoice and a PO so we can close the work order and the money that we spend and the hours are spent are logged into each piece of equipment. So that helps us in capital planning. So if we if we see that something is a repeat offender, I'll call it, if it just keeps getting hammered with repair calls, that's how we start looking at things. Like it's starting to cost us more money than the equipment's worth. We target it for replacement. It goes into the capital plan. So there, there are things we can, could be doing that um, that we're not, that we'd like to roll out, but that's, you know, one of those type of things. Yeah. This gives you a look from uh, FY17 uh, to uh, FY18 on work orders. Um, if you look, we've um, we completed 2,599 work orders in 18 and 2,448 and, um, and 17 is 2,599 and 2,488 and 18. We basically run around 23 to 2,600 work orders per year. Um, it's pretty consistent. What drives that number up is if we have uh, unanticipated or extraordinary repairs, we call them, or a big breakdown, um, that number could go up. Um, a lot of numbers, if you look, the high school is the biggest, is the producer of work orders, basically because of the square footage. That footprint is 375,000 square feet. But we do track everything down to athletic fields, uh, even Matera Cabin, Matera Garage, and DPW. Everything, it's, we track it so, and we try to tell people, and everybody's really good about using the module. Um, you can't really, um, we don't know it if it's not put in a work order, and we can't track it if you know, if people aren't participating in the program. I've got a great response. Um, over 600 users in School Dude right now, that's the name of the module, that are actually questers in there, in this town and school wide. Joe, could you give us some sort of breakdown on the nature of the work orders at high school uh, by percent, uh, general terms? In terms of like what's work orders? Yeah, what, what, what's work being done? Um, so within it's like a lot for a, about 12 it's, year old facility. it's really not. I mean, if you look at some of the other locations, it could be anything from, um, here's, a, here's an example, the high school on the roof of the building has how many pieces of equipment up there? Over 200 pieces oh, yeah. of equipment up oh, there. Sure. Yeah, between yeah. rooftop units, exhaust fans, okay. things of that nature, it, there's just a lot of equipment up there because of the square footage so of the there's building. There's a big HVAC component to that. There's a huge right. HVAC oh, yeah. component, huge. which might yeah. come in as 1 p.m., but it's multiple work orders that come in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be a spike in a building for those type of reasons. We track even the movement of uh, supplies and equipment. If, if there's a request put in to move something that's custodial related, yeah. we track the work order because we're using staff to do that. Thanks. So. Why is Parker so much higher than Coolidge? Again, um, they're both pretty close in square footage. It, it, it just depends what kind of year we had. It depends. I think it Parker is... They have a core that's pretty old, right? Yeah. Parker is actually a little bit bigger in square footage, but there have been years when they've been the, the opposite. Mm -hmm. So this slide right here gives you an idea of what we perform in-house and what's uh, outsourced. So 73% in FY17 was uh, 
in-house and then 27 percent was outsourced and the same goes for FY18 we hired a fourth person um, in FY17 a carpenter we have in the in the department we have a master electrician master plumber and two carpenters and having that fourth person is a real key component it helps us gives the electrician and the plumber time to go out and diagnose problems so we don't have to make the phone call to our HVAC contractor. They do a lot of that stuff. They'll do pump replacements. Having that fourth person gives us a little more bandwidth to get other things done. So that's why that number is uh, where it is right there, and it's pretty consistent. So this slide right here, well, this, this is just a slide to show you folks what our elect electricity usage per square foot is. Looking at the buildings, the police department, Main Street Fireshin, again, those are public safety buildings. You'd expect that to happen in a public safety building because they're 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, you look down the, if you look down the line at the um, Reading Public Library in there, uh, which one is it? It's the fifth one from the end, right? The fifth one from the... Yeah, the fifth one from the right. Right. Now, if you go to the next slide, you're going to notice that the natural gas for the Reading Public Library is lowest, and that's because when they converted and we renovated it, we have a small amount of uh, gas-fired equipment and more heat pumps in that building, so it the other way, okay? That just gives you an idea, and if you look like DPW Garage, a lot of that's driven by winter, winter storms and natural gas usage. Yeah. That building's open sometimes for two and three days at a time. Could, could you go to the previous slide for me? Sure. So the schools and the electric usage are relatively low. And there's reasons for that. I mean, we have a really, um, a, a really good controls in the school buildings with the energy management systems. Um, we are we utilize with that program I was telling you folks about the utility program and the as well as the FS automation. So we have a we have good control over um, what spaces are occupied and what are not down to the room almost. Yeah. In the town buildings, it's a little bit different because it's a different it's a whole different animal. The buildings are different than schools. They just operate differently and they're set up differently. Just late since there's two alone at night that we've done in the past we've had put in even though we still may have custodians in the building later at night they're on one right. side so the other side those sensors are timed out and the lights are going off take some of the public safety buildings or all of them and get constantly in there there's constant movement the lights are always right. on yeah okay joe why is wood in so high in terms of what electricity usage because the wood end school has mostly uh, has large air moving equipment over there instead of hydronic because of the uh, heating factor. Can you just go back um, to the sl slide? Sorry. Yeah. So I just I I didn't give give you folks a slide, but I want to just ex uh, let you guys know what. So we have four maintenance guys, and we're just building maintenance now, handling a million square feet, and everything else is outsourced. And I'm just going to read through the list really quick. So we outsource fire suppression, fire alarm, HVAC, building controls, roofing, elevator, glass repair, electrical projects, pest management security, carpet tile replacements, boiler, painting, masonry, generator surgery straps and drains, and overhead doors. So where we might not have large numbers of staff in-house, we manage a huge amount of outside contractors that are uh, procured through um, the town of Reading. So that's a big part of what we're doing also. So there's lots of people in and out of our building that we're, that we're overseeing. Yes, sorry, Kathy. Joe, is, is using contractors instead of hiring staff, is that the most efficient way to we, we get hired the work done? A, we hired an electrician. We, we didn't have an electrician for a long time. We hired an electrician um, in 2015, I think it was. It was 15, I believe it was. And it was what I would call budget neutral and it's worked out great. We still have to have an electrical contractor on staff for certain projects because they can't do, he can't do everything. 99% yeah. of the work is done in-house. There are other things potentially we could bring in. One of them might be something that's like HVAC, yeah. but finding someone that has the, um, the skill set that we have and with the equipment we run it is difficult with the with particularly in this market the market's yeah. just way too competitive now to hire somebody with the experience right. that we need right. and the vast array of equipment that we have yeah it's very difficult to find somebody that's that well-rounded right right and i know hvacs 
are can be very complicated and if you don't know what you're doing we have a little bit of everything here too yeah we have a little bit of everything um, so, so a number of years ago, um, we did a performance contracting mm -hmm. where we looked at a lot of sort of the older buildings and, mm -hmm. you know, spent a lot of money up front and mm -hmm. the payback was, I mean, I mean, the, it was not budget neutral. We, we you know, we, we made mm -hmm. out. I mean, now that sort of another, I don't know, seven, eight years have gone by. Mm -hmm. um, is it worth taking a look at performance contracting too? We've, is, are there yeah. opportunities? We've, we've talked to Bob about that. We've had conversations. Um, one of the things that was too expensive to do at the time was LEDs because LEDs at the time, the technology was, it, the payback was like over 30 year payback. Right. LED lights have gone down tremendously in price. So if we were going to do another project, it would probably be a, a, a large scale LED conversion. We did do an LED conversion with RMLD in this building, in this room, the next room over, and all the common areas about a year and a half ago. We got a good rebate on that. <coughs> we also did the police station common areas last summer, I want to say. It was last, this past summer. This past summer. Yep. We did, uh, and this is on our own with our own people, um, we did all the common areas of Joshua Eaton, and we did about 60 fixtures over at Birch Meadow just recently. We are also in the process, we just purchased a, um, uh, 25 or 30 fixtures for the high bay garage at the DPW, which we're hoping is it's going to save a ton of money down there because that place is up. The lights are on. They'll be on sensors, so we're looking to do that as well as uh, the field house at the high school. So to answer your question, we're always looking to save money. That would be the next one to do. But that, yeah, but things like, like boilers and, you know, com performance contract did a lot of the heavy equipment. It yeah. did a lot of the heavy, the heavy equipment, and it took a lot of money, a lot of items off the capital plan. So we're following along with that same thought process that when we replace stuff, it's with high efficiency, like the boiler at the high school that's getting done. Is, that's uh, in process. Or that's in process right now. Okay. Yep. Can I ask a question about um, thoughts about incorporating solar? I don't think we have any solar in any town building. We have acres and acres of like rooftops with so solar potential. We've had discussions with RMLD about that, and when we had Noresco come out and look at the buildings, the problem we have is that the even though we do have lots of rooftop space, we don't have a lot of clear rooftop space. Like the high school, for instance, um, the side of the building that we want to put it on, and John, Bob, you might remember, I think it was the side that is in the parking lot, and it that just says. The field, the field. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Um, the newer buildings, because of the air requirements and the code, have a ton of equipment on the rooftop, so an array on the roof wasn't really going to work for us. Mm -hmm. Something that was a ground level type of thing, mm -hmm. that would be something would, that would work out better. Um, I have to tell you, I saw a map of Massachusetts, and we have some of the best solar people in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. ironically. Um, and there's a big like, black hole where Reading is. And th we're not the only community, but there's lots of solar in the state, and Reading is absolutely a black hole where there's none. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just something to keep in mind with all of the um, commercial projects yeah, that are being done downtown as well as, as I think. You know, I think yeah. we have lots of public buildings with lots of rooftops, and, and you're raising some great. Good. Well, just to, I just like to comment on that. The reason there's so much less sold in this area is because our these rates are so low. That's the reason. That's residential. No, but I'm not like writing specific. I know. It's a little bit of a All right. These rates are so competitive. That's a good point. Yeah. Just don't feel obliged to go that direction. I hear you, but I also sat there a presentation where they're like, we're going to have to raise rate, you guys, because we're not selling enough electricity. So yeah, it's just something saying, that... Historically, that's the... Yes, yeah, historically, yeah, absolutely. Just, it just, yeah, the, the economics of solar have changed very dramatically yeah. in the last five years. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is something we should take another look at. Probably not right now, but but I... I, I, I will say I that... It, 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 we're doing solar preheat panels. We have solar domestic hot water at both fire stations and the police station. Oh, yeah. And we also at the high school, and this was all part of the Noresco project as well, we do what they call a solar wall. So um, there's a, a basically a giant duct on the side of the building that's heated by the sun. And instead of bringing in when, on those days when we're bringing in that outdoor air and you know, a day like today when it was that cold, it's preheating it. So the unit's working, not working as hard to warm that air up. So we did, we did take advantage of the little bit of solar that we could. Great, thank you.
This is the, this this next slide here just shows shows water and sewer uh, usage in gallons per square foot, by square foot. If you, at the bottom there's a little note there, Coolidge and Wood End, you're going to see those numbers are up. Those both have irrigation systems at them, so and that's tied into our water and sewer bill. Okay, so getting into the budget. Um, we're looking to, we're requesting for the town facilities a, a 7.12% increase in town facilities. And that's driven, um, town facilities budget uh, in, includes the, um, the four custodians, the contract cleaning for four buildings, and the supplies associated with that. When we get to the next slide, I can give you folks a breakdown. Core facilities is going up, uh, requesting 3.76%. Uh, for a total of four point, I can't even write it up on my side. <laughs> yeah, four point four. Four point four percent. The salary line, the next one down there on the on the town facilities is five point five percent increase. Uh, that has some uh, contractual changes as well as an increase in the overtime budget, uh, which is a three thousand dollar increase, I believe, in overtime. And then the core facilities is going up 3.8%. Again, that is an increase of $5,000 over time budget as well as some contractual obligations. The expenses for the town facilities budget is 11% and going up 11% and the core facilities is going up 3.77%. And below, if you look, you'll see the accommodated cost, the electricity and the natural gas um, the electricity went up 4%, um, natural gas 4%, and the uh, water and sewer was 5%. The next slide will give you more detail. Somebody have a question? Give us a minute. Okay. So, Joe, on the, on the water and sewer, um, um, I think we raise rates for next year. So uh, should it be... This is F.1, so yes. I thought we just, when we did the water and sewer, I thought that was for next year. Not for FY20. No, that's for, for right now. For right okay. now. It, it does go into the first quarter if you will, the fiscal. Um, okay. so, so potentially water and sewer could be lower if we do the same thing. You'll find out Tuesday. <laughs> so um, if I'm reading this correctly, the drivers for this increase are. So the drivers for this, but yeah, the cleaning services are there. We're right now we we've bid this out through combines and competitive bid process through yep. the state of Massachusetts. The contract ends in October of um, nineteen, mm -hmm. and from what we're being told, going to be approximately a fifteen percent increase in that, and it's driven by three factors. One of them is the um, the. Employer Medical Assistance Contribution, EMAC, which is a 5% tax, mm -hmm. is going up. Um, there's also minimum wage increases, which even if folks do not make minimum wage, it's going to cause increase in their rate to, yeah. to, the, uh, to the custodial staff um, and the Massachusetts paid leave law. Now, yeah. we, this is what I would look at it like as a worst case scenario. We'll go competitively again and go for the best possible price we can get using combines. If you look down, there is a decrease in the uniform allowance. We kept some money in that line right there to cover embroidery, which we pay for. That is all part of the um, wages for the uh, custodial staff on the town side. Mm -hmm. Everything else is level funded. We, we buy all of our custodial supplies, uh, paper products and everything, also on a competitive bid process. Mm -hmm. And we being told that everything's gonna remain relatively flat. And that's what you get for you. That's the 7.12 percent increase. When is the, uh, the Family Leave Act uh, is not supposed to start until 2020 or 2021? I was told it was 2020. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Well, it's here. <clears throat> okay. Next slide. So this is the core facilities budget, which um, is the salary line one is is 3.8 percent increase. The reasons I told you, folks. And then if you look at the expenses, the first line is 21 um, 21 percent increase, and we've increased some of the lines. Yeah, architectural fees has gone up. We've added money for ice melt, five thousand dollars. We did decrease the uniform line. 
So that was a total of $8,300 in that particular line right there. The other one that went up was the other maintenance and, and repair line, which went up 45%. And that particular line there was we had money added to the budget to uh, maintain the turf fields, which is under the control of the core facilities budget, and some more money on, in our other maintenance and repair line to cover some increased costs that we've been experiencing. Everything else is level funded, and it's important to remember those contracts off to you folks a few minutes ago. Um, Everything has everything we we manage has been rebid in the last year and a half, and we have experienced some pretty good savings. So that's how we're able to do this. So that's it. So Joe, on the um, the other maintenance and repairs, the twenty looks like the twenty thousand dollar increase you had attributed to the maintenance of the turf fields. Is that um, something that we would anticipate would be lower once we actually take care of the turf fields if we wind up doing that. Is, it, is that an indication of just the poor condition that they're in and it requires more to upkeep them? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you're always, we're always going to have to have a preventive maintenance program on the turf fields, which will probably cost us around 10 grand a year, 8 to 10. Yeah, but this went up 20. Right, and we're, right now what we're doing is we're making sure that we keep the fields going as long as possible by yeah. doing a robust repair program. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? I, um, we don't have any minutes, right? No. Okay. Um, so. With that, I think, uh, I have, we're going to talk about one show. Wait, wait. What Dan has a question. No, oh, you tell me to wait. No, no. I, I mean, from, yeah, yeah. Bob, uh, what is your view on the need for a meeting next Wednesday? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, not for budget reasons. I would suggest that there are other reasons we do a meeting, and if we are hell bent on having another meeting, let's have it in January. I, I tend, it's a very busy month. I, I there's a lot going there. on Wednesday, too. There's ZBA. There's yeah, stuff that's happening yeah. at the library. Um, yeah. but it's actually the only meeting of that, which is in the evening. Right. So those yeah, of us that we'd be able to go to. So. Or fold it into another January meeting. John, last night, John did mention he would not be able to make next Wednesday, just like right. tonight. Just so you know. And I'll, I'll be late if I make it at all. So. Yeah. No, I, I'm not inclined to okay. call a meeting for next Excellent. Wednesday. Right. Okay. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Yes. Any, any what, motion to adjourn? Yes. Thank you. Second. Um, all in favor? Yes. All right. Okay.